Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul is talking with Czech practitioner and licensed massage therapist, Greg Schmaus. Greg began his journey as an athlete, skiing and playing soccer, and then won a scholarship to play Division I golf. During his time as a collegiate golfer, he began to struggle with a variety of health challenges, including obsessive compulsive disorder. This led him on a healing journey, including two years of personal coaching and mentoring with Paul, which helped him develop and acquire the tools and techniques that he now shares with his clients in his own private coaching practice. Hi, everybody. With the coronavirus pandemic, a world full of people that are confused about what health is and how to create it, and a myriad of negative stressors, there are massive numbers of people experiencing a mental health crisis right now. In this special episode, I dive deep into the issues of mental health challenges and how we can use natural holistic approaches to healing with Greg Schmaus. Greg suffered a severe case of OCD, anxiety, bouts of depression, and a total loss of his sense of self, his direction and purpose in life until he began his deep, honest, holistic journey into healing with me as his therapist and life coach. Get ready for one of the most interesting, riveting, and educational podcasts I've ever done. This is one you're surely going to want to share with anyone suffering a mental health challenge today. Enjoy, and as always, share your feedback and send your questions for our Q&A podcasts. Hope you enjoy it. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, our topic is overcoming OCD and the mental health crisis. I'm very excited to share one of my students and someone who was a client of mine for two and a half years and made a really powerful journey from being in a real tough spot to healing, becoming very whole and living his dream fully. He's an amazing man, Greg Shamas, and uh, I'm really excited for us to all hear his journey and his experiences and give you guys all an opportunity to learn some of the many natural, uh, non-invasive approaches that we use and that I use in my coaching and that Greg now uses in his coaching to help people with challenges like OCD and a, a variety of mental health challenges. And as most of you know, today we are in a mental health crisis. We have the highest rates of suicide in pretty much every category ever ever measured, the highest rates of depression, anxiety, and a wide variety of things that are tracked back to a lot of the things that we'll talk about. And unfortunately, most people aren't aware of these things, so they end up getting put on drugs, and they often just tailspin down until some kind of a major event happens, or they're segregated from their families and things like that. So Greg, welcome to Living 4D, buddy. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. You and I have been on quite a journey together, so it's cool that we get to share some of it. Absolutely. And, you know, I was a long time ago, as you and I both uh, talked, I was said, you know, we really got to share your journey with uh, all the podcast listeners in the world because myself, having worked with a, quite a number of people with these challenges, um, you know, I'm very aware of what can be done. But the challenge is that it takes honest work to heal from these types of challenges. And you were committed to the work. It took us two and a half years to get you out the other side of this thing. And so now you're you're uh, really enjoying some freedom and sharing a lot of the lessons that you learned in your practice, aren't you? Yeah, well, it's it's funny how when I started with a lot of the traditional approaches, I had this feeling that this was happening to me. And I was experiencing a condition that I wasn't sure that I was going to be able to get resolved from the help I was receiving. And when you and I started working together, the first thing that you really shared with me was really that, Greg, this isn't happening to you. This is happening for you. That's right. (laughs) And what I came to realize was the OCD that I really experience was actually one of the greatest gifts I ever received in the sense that one, it gave me what you called an internship with you. Yes. And two, it allowed me to develop the tools and techniques that I now use in my own practice and share with clients that some might be experiencing similar symptoms, but also 
a lot of people are experiencing the same issues on a deeper level, but they're just manifesting in different ways. Yes, but, or they're or they're or they're just not getting diagnosed because you know how people are you know, there's a real phobia around any kind of mental issues. People are happy to go get help for necks, back, shoulders, you know, digestion, elimination, heart. But people have this real phobia that if someone looks at their brain, that there's something very deeply wrong. So there's, uh, you know, yeah. uncountable, undiagnosed, unreported cases of the kinds of challenges that you've worked through out there. Yeah, but as I'm sure we'll explore, you can't really separate the two. <laughs> So no. there's an issue in the mind or the brain, or there's an issue in the lower back or the shoulder. A lot of times it's a two way street. So what might appear as a back or shoulder issue might really originate in the mind or the brain. So, yeah. And so just a little, a little background for everybody listening. Um, when Greg first started working with me, how long ago was that now, Greg? Let's see. That was. That was been probably a, four years ago. Yeah, about four years ago. Three and a half, four years ago. Yeah. So what happened was is Penny started getting emails from Greg's mother, who was really working hard to get Greg on my schedule, but I was full at the time and had a waiting list. And you know, I get requests constantly, as those of you listening can probably imagine. So more emails came and each email got more desperate. And finally, she, his Greg's mother started calling and called the Czech Institute and ultimately got a hold of Penny and, and really just said, he needs Paul's help. He trusts Paul. He, he's tried all sorts of stuff. He's getting worse, not better. Please help my son. So Penny said to me, Paul, I think you really should consider talking to this woman about her son because she's really, really concerned about him and adamant that he gets your help. So I connected to my soul and asked, should I take this client on Greg Schmaus, even though I am book solid and don't have a lot of room for a new client? And the answer was a very strong yes. And my soul said, this experience of his healing will help him help countless people and you have a sole contract to fulfill with him. And the rest is history, isn't it? Absolutely. And I, I so, mean, I distinctly remember um, being back in college and working with a lot of other therapists, and nothing was really working. Some of them were actually making some of my conditions worse. And I knew about your work because my trainer, when I was in college, was a Czech practitioner. That's cool. So I would be in school studying your work rather than studying schoolwork. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> like J.P. Sears. I would, <laughs> yeah. I would be driving to school listening to your videos, driving home listening to your videos, and being like, wow, I learned more on my ride to and from school more than I did actually in school. And, <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of your teaching started to really give me some relief and some support. And I knew that you and I working together was really going to take me where I needed to go. So, so thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for being so committed. Cause uh, you know, as you know, as a Czech professional and therapist yourself, when you're working with people that are only half in, it can be very draining. It's really more like professional babysitting and listening to people complain, but then they don't do the work. And so one of the things that made my work with you so enjoyable is that you really did the work. And for me, when you, when my, my client or patient does the work, because every client is sort of an experiment, there's no cut and dried, you know, you can try the same technique with 10 people and you'll get 10 different results, but you don't really know if something's going to work until the patient or the client applies it correctly. And so often people are complaining they're not getting better, but when I check over and over again, they're either not doing things or they're doing them half-assed, which is for me as a therapist or a coach is just draining. It's like, okay, more of this stuff. Somebody who wants to be rescued instead of actually embracing their opportunity to heal and grow. So having you really participate was a great relief, but I think it's also an important message for people listening if you if you really want to heal from something, I don't care if it's a physical, emotional, mental, or spiritual crisis, you really have to fully participate 
And if you don't, you're constantly going to be dealing with the mirror of self. You'll be getting yourself back constantly. And yeah. Greg, with that kind of uh, preamble, I'd love it if you, for, for the listeners, if you can give us an overview of events, of all the events that you feel were contributors to you getting diagnosed with OCD and the ultimate crisis that led yeah. you to me. How, how did it give us the sort of the Reader's Digest version of how this all came to be? Yeah, so, well, growing up, I was always an athlete. I was a soccer player, a ski racer, and eventually started playing golf full time. And I left home at 16. I went to a golf and tennis academy in Hilton Head, South Carolina. And I spent two years there. And during my senior year, I got a scholarship to play Division I golf at the University of Houston. Well, that's so great. my th this was back in 2010. And my freshman year, I was just starting my second semester. And one night I wake up, it's probably around 12.30, 1 in the morning, with the most excruciating pain in one of my testicles. And I tried to get up and stand up. I almost passed out, so I couldn't really walk. It was just so painful that I was, I was almost throwing up in the bathroom. And I wake my roommate up and I tell him, look, I don't know what's going on, but you got to take me to the ER. So he basically carries me into his car. He drives me to the hospital. And it turns out I had a testicular torsion in which one of the testicles rotates and cuts off circulation. And essentially, if you don't have surgery or get it resolved, like you can lose, you can lose your testicles. So Not a good idea. No, no. So, uh, so I end up having surgery, go under anesthesia. I come out of the surgery and I'm in a wheelchair. I can't walk yet. And I'm all strapped up and wrapped up and basically just lying in bed, really unable to do anything. So I'm, I'm really going from being a Division One athlete and overnight, I'm basically laying unable to walk, just had my testicles cut open. And I start having um, really poor sleep, some nightmares. And one of the first few nights, I wake up and really feel as though I saw someone, a woman in the hotel room by the door. And I'm just coming out of anesthesia. So a lot of like the cognitive processes are a little distorted sometimes. And it really, really freaked me out. And I was really taken back. And I really wasn't able to go back to sleep. I was in a really vulnerable state where I was basically kind of strapped to the bed. I'm not able to get up or walk around or get fresh air or anything. So I really experienced a level of vulnerability that I had never experienced before. And for the next few weeks, I wasn't able to sleep. Anytime I was in a building, I would always be checking doors to make sure there was no one there. And over time, my mind would start repeating these images and repeating thoughts and words and phrases in my mind thousands of times a day. Anytime I was in a building, I was always checking doors. So after a while, I wasn't able to sit in a classroom for more than 20 or 30 minutes with having to go up, without having to go outside. So I ended up having to leave school after that semester and take a year off. And over the next few years, things actually got worse in the sense that I had a mind that was just constantly repeating things, checking things, and I would go... I would go months to years at a time with the same thing, kind of almost on like autoplay in my mind, where if I went five or six minutes without an episode, it was a miracle. And one of the hardest parts about it was before that, I never really experienced anything like this. So a part of me held a lot of shame around it and really wasn't really willing to share any of what I was experiencing because I thought people would think I was crazy. I, I thought I was going crazy. Um, and it really took a few years of really deep struggle and um, intense pain for me to start talking to my parents about it and seeking help. And that probably went on for a good five or so years before you and I met. Wow. I, I forgot that it was that long. And, yeah. and uh, just for reasons of completeness, 
correct me if I'm wrong, but the woman that you saw was quite scary for you. And she kept reappearing, which is one of the reasons that you didn't really enjoy falling asleep. Is that correct? Yes, I would have I would have trouble falling asleep, but on the other hand, I would almost look forward to sleeping because when I was sleeping, well, that was the only time I wasn't experiencing my mind. Right. So it was and really then, a conscious state that appeared as though it was giving me some relief because um, the waking hours were so difficult. Right. Um, and let's try not to forget to share when we get to the uh, you know, a good point because we have lots to talk about right now, but I'd, I want to make sure we share how we dealt with that woman. You want me to go into that right now or you want to save it? Well, we'll, we'll save it for when we get into some of the approaches that we use yeah, to absolutely. help you heal. Cause uh, I want to, I want to leave you guys a little cliffhanger because uh, this I've, I've worked with many people that have these kinds of challenges. It often happens when people do shamanic journeys and get overdosed and Mm -hmm. or have uh, traumas in their life of a variety of types from closed head injuries to sexual trauma to uh, violence in the family and things like that. So um, there's a lot of this stuff going on out there, but very few people that really know how to deal with it. What I'd love it if you could do is give the listeners an explanation of what OCD is and how it differs from some of the common challenges out there, such as anxiety ADHD, multiple personality disorder, and, and other common diagnoses that people may have heard of, but don't sure. may not really know, A, what OCD is or what some of these other things are. Right. So from my perspective, um, OCD occurs when, first of all, OCD is really the need to repeat or ritualize any thought patterns or behaviors. And from my personal experience, this usually occurs after a trauma. And when someone has a trauma and they experience a sense of vulnerability that goes so deep and is so threatening and scary, the brain and the nervous system want to do everything it can to never re-experience that level of vulnerability again. So what, what the psyche does is it starts setting up these routines and rituals and thought patterns as a way of avoiding this level of vulnerability. And what I also began to experience and realize is when there's emotions that we're not willing to experience, if you think of like emotions as energy and motion, when we're willing to experience and feel them and digest them and process them, those emotions stay in motion. But when we experience a trauma and we create a resistance around these emotions, that energy gets trapped. And when that energy gets trapped, it builds up a level of intensity that eventually it needs a release valve. And that release valve often shows up as symptoms of OCD, whether it's repeating something mentally, repeating something behavior-wise. Um, so basically, from my experience, there's a trauma, there's a level of vulnerability, and we create these um, conditions as a means of never wanting to re-experience any of that again. How that differs from anxiety, um, to me, anxiety is very much a broad term, but one of my favorite, I think I've heard you speak about this, is anxiety is really when we're living in the future, and depression really exists when we're living in the past. Yeah. And anxiety of- is anxiety is essentially summarized to I'm afraid of what's going to happen in the next minute or tomorrow. And depression is the past equals the future. Yeah. And a lot of times it's really kind of two polarities of two polarities of the same energy in the sense that anxiety is almost like the masculine energy where depression is the feminine energy. And a lot of times we start with anxiety. And by the time we burn that energy out, it becomes more internal and becomes more of a depression. So right. the root issue can actually be the same, whether it's anxiety or depression. Hi, everyone. In this interview, you're hearing Greg Schmaus and I talk about how he overcame serious mental health challenges using my four doctor approach to healing. It's important to remember that our minds interface with our bodies via our biochemistry. 
The quality of our nutrition determines the health and balance of our hormonal system, which is the interface between the invisible world of thought and the tangible world of your body and the emotions you experience. There are two products I generally recommend for people to enhance mental emotional well-being. They are Organifi's Certified Organic Green Juice, which contains moringa, chlorella, mint, spirulina, beets, matcha green tea, wheatgrass, and ashwagandha, which is an excellent adaptogen or stress-relieving herb. And I recommend their Complete Protein, which contains pea protein, quinoa, pumpkin seed, coconut, vanilla bean, monk fruit, real whole food vitamins, and digestive enzymes to support optimal absorption. When we have the quality plant nutrition and protein together, we have the necessary nutrition to balance our biochemistry, feed our body, and effectively generate mood-regulating hormones while having optimal cognitive performance. I know of no better, cleaner, more nutritious, and easier to use food sources than Organifi products, and even kids can use them without needing parents to cook or prepare such great nutrition for them. Go to Organifi, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com, and check out their amazing product line. To get your Living 4D with Paul Check discount at checkout, use the code, capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. To get to know Drew Canoli, the founder of Organifi, listen to Living 4D with Paul Check, episode 64, Drew Canoli, UBU. And I think when you meet the man behind the products, you'll see not only why I love Organifi, but why I love Drew Canoli. Enjoy. I mean, ADHD or ADD is really kind of an, an attention disorder where there's really an inability to focus the mind on one given point. Um, which I don't really have much experience with ADHD myself. And in terms of the multiple personality disorder, one of my perspectives, which I'm curious your, your opinion on, is if you take the word personality that's rooted in the word persona. And mm-hmm. if you study, one of my favorite authors is Alan Watts. He talks about the the root of persona is actually the role or the mask that actors would wear when they were um, performing on stage in certain plays or performances. And a lot of times when we have multiple personalities, we have multiple masks that we're wearing at any given moment. And when an ego has not fully individuated, it's quite unsure which mask it's supposed to wear to fit the mold of a society or culture or tribe. And when we have these multiple personalities, it can actually become quite anxiety provoking. And I also feel as though social anxiety exists when essentially we're not quite sure which mask we're supposed to wear in any given moment. And it's kind of like an actor having to play seven different roles in a play, which consumes a lot more energy than only having to play one role, which would be yourself. Yes. So, yeah. Well, I was just agreeing with everything you've said, uh, but I know you were, I thought you were asking me a question. I'm just having a hard time figuring out what the question is. No, I was, I was curious if you had a similar perspective on the multiple personalities. Um, yes. In terms of, like, yeah. The lack of individuation. Well, yeah, definitely. Multiple personalities though, uh, often stems from the same thing that attention deficit hyperactivity disorder does. And both of those, in my experience and study, have their root in um, poor, uh, basically insecure attachment to the parents. If, when I've, I've done mm-hmm. a lot of research into attachment syndromes, and if one or both of the parents is threatening to the child, or one of the, one of the parents is creating a secure attachment, but the other parent is threatening, then the child has to figure out how, what role it has to play when its drunk father comes home or what role it has Mm -hmm. to play when it's with its depressed mother Mm -hmm. or any, anybody else that's a caregiver or a sibling that's traumatic to the child. So the child actually learns that I have to behave this way to feel safe and get love from this person but I have to behave this way to feel safe and get loved by that person. And mm-hmm. if I don't do it, then I'm in pain and I may not be loved and I feel isolated, alone, and scared. Mm-hmm. So if a person, if a person's life circumstances are such that 
both parents are scary, which is really, really quite common today. Um, Basil van der Klock in his book, um, I forgot the title of his book. Um, your body keeps the score. Yeah. Your yeah. body keeps the score. Yeah. The statistics he gives. Oh, yeah. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm actually reading that book right now. Yeah. It's an excellent book. And yeah. the, the statistics he gives on violence in families is just mind boggling in their current statistics. And, uh, you know, there's just, that book is such an eye opener to the real depth of the trauma that we have in, in cultures around the world. But so the point is, is that attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is what happens when a child is in an environment where there's perceived threats. And so mm. the mind of the child has to constantly keep surveying the environment, looking for threats. So if a, if a child cries because it's hungry or it's got a wet diaper that's hurting it, or it has needs and it doesn't get met or the parent comes and then screams at it or the father yells to shut up or hits the child. Then the child really begins to see the, the two people that are supposed to keep it safe, that it's the most connected to biologically and literally at every level. It's like an extension of the being of the parents. And those are the only two people in the world that the child feels connected to and safe with. But when those people or any of the siblings or caregivers become threatening, then the child doesn't know how to find safety. And for its own survival, it develops the habit of constantly surveying the environment for threats. So when those children show up in, in kindergartens and, and elementary schools, they can't focus because their unconscious has now programmed them to believe that even the people that love you most are dangerous. And since our mother father, mother father archetypes are the archetypal um, experience of a child as to what we can expect from all women, from the mother, and the father is the model for what we can expect from all men, to the degree that mother or father or both are scary, we, we as children see the world full of these big people, but we're perceiving that they are going to be just like mother or father. So if you can imagine a child who comes from an environment where mother and father are both not meeting its needs for food, for safety, for love, for connection, etc., then you put a kid like that in school and it really is in a situation where it's kind of like somebody who's walking alone at night in a part of town that's known for a lot of violence and muggings, they can't relax mm -hmm. and they're constantly nervous, you know? Right. And, and those types of pathologies, if they're not addressed, they grow into more serious pathologies such as OCD or any number of, of, uh, psychological disorders such as sch schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm curious if you feel also the multiple personality disorders, could that come from the misuse of psychedelics? It can. Um, it's not so much likely to be multiple personality disorder as it, as it is to be schizophrenia. Because if you, um, if if a person takes in a higher dose of a psychedelic medicine, then their ego ego structure can can actually integrate. Then, because psychedelics basically um, disable what's called the default mode network in the brain, which is the circuits that give one a sense of feeling of self, they, de they begin to have experiences of all the unconscious material that's repressed. Um, and the child, of course, as you know, is, is downloading every single experience day and night, like a, a, a 24 seven, uh, video, audio, video recording system. Mm -hmm. So even though mom and dad are fighting in the other room, the child's picking it all up. So if there's trauma in the environment or if, if it's exposed to de television shows with violence at an early age and it sees people bleeding and getting their heads blown off and all the kinds of stuff we see on television, mm -hmm. then when the medicine, the psychedelic medicine starts breaking the, dis uh, dissolving the barriers of the default mode network or the ego structure, all this unconscious material rises up and the person on the drug can't differentiate their unconscious material from from the reality of what their conscious mind would tell them in other words they might be laying in a room with a bunch of other people but feel like they're in the middle of a of a battlefield or going through hell or being tortured or 
having a dragon trying to eat them or a snake or a tiger or any number of things because they cannot tell the difference. And, and with many psychedelics and plant medicines, the intensity of those experiences is so vivid and powerful. It actually feels more real than your waking state. Right. So when people get into those kinds of situations, they basically come out of them with what I would call a fractured ego or a fractured sense of self. Mm -hmm. And when I look at them clairvoyantly, the most common thing I see can be analogized, analogized to if you take a rock and throw it at a mirror, like a bathroom mirror, it'll shatter that mirror. And it'll, when you see the mirror, there'll be all sorts of jagged, broken parts where now the glass isn't there, but the black backing of the mirror might be there. So each piece of glass that's missing in the mirror that's been shattered represents what in Native American uh, Indian culture is called a soul loss. Mm -hmm. That is a part of their consciousness that they can no longer access because that broken piece of glass represents the traumatic experience that they're having at any given instant. So if all of a sudden they're feeling like a tiger is about to eat them, the shock of that pushes them right out of themselves. Just like if you're sitting, driving your road down the road in your car and someone's driving at you head on, the experience can be so shocking. The psyche will literally jump out of the body to avoid the experience of the trauma. So the body will go into shock, but the psyche can be 10, 12, 15 feet above the body. Mm -hmm. So as a, as someone who is using modern shamanism, when I look at that person, I see all these areas where they've become in such a state of shock from the plant medicine experience that they actually stop inhabiting themselves. And that part is basically frozen in time, but that part actually remains conscious awareness and it becomes like a watchdog looking constantly in the environment for any associations with anything that it experienced. So for example, if it was a tiger, then they'll be looking constantly for tigers. If it was uh, the memory of being beaten up by their father, then it will be scared to death when any man that approaches it looks anything, talks anything, smells anything, or wears the same kind of clothing or any associative connection to the father. So it sets up, not only does it set up um, a lot of anxiety and ADHD type behavior, but because there's- it can trigger OCD because it's constantly trying to figure out what do I have to do to create safety? Mm -hmm. But what happens is it also creates this flood of images as though somebody is watching multiple televisions, 20, 30, 40 televisions at once. And so the psyche can actually remain open because if a person does not go through a proper integration ceremony the medicine actually activates brain circuits that tap into other dimensions of reality that normally we consider to be unconscious or super conscious. But now that person's default mode network being disintegrated is like a, a filtration system that's broken. So all these other dimensions that we would normally only experience, for example, in dream reality or in meditative states where we're doing guided astral travel or astral travel or remote viewing, now they're actually tapping into so much of the other dimensions of the universe that normally the human psyche in its normal waking state is unaware of, that it's as though they're living in multiple dimensions at once, and each part of them is having experiences that can be just as real and just as scary as they had here in their original insult where they were traumatized. And right. the sad thing is people keep running back to medical doctors to get put on stronger and stronger drugs and to, to so-called shaman and people using psychedelics. And if they aren't properly integrated, all it does is worsen the trauma. And I've seen many cases of that. Yeah. And also people who are classified to have some of these traditional psychological conditions actually often have deep psychic abilities that just have become that are not yet developed yet and Absolutely. A, lot of the, a lot of the symptoms of these challenges are actually one can be working as a channel one can be psychic one can be tapping into kind of like deeper energetic frequencies and 
um, a lot of these issues can actually be opportunities to develop a lot of these psychic abilities as well. Absolutely. Uh, you know, in shamanism, a crisis like that is often considered an initiation into shamanism, which is exactly what I told you yours was. Yours is a, a really an, an in initiatory crisis to, mm -hmm. to, it, to um, basically create a situation in which you have to find the right kind of help to do the integration work in order for you to realize the injury is actually a gift, but you have to learn to manage the flow of <clears throat> energy and information, which can only happen when you have an integrated ego, or as Jung would call it, you become an individuated whole person, mm -hmm. which as you know, from experience is, is quite a journey. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there's always, uh, a silver lining inside every cloud of gray, but it sometimes takes a mentor. And when we look at the hero's journey, there's three phases to it. The departure. So the event that triggers the crisis or the need to uh, make changes, become a rebel or escape the confines of parents or society or cultural programming. The ordeal and the ordeal is what you met me. When you met me, you were in the ordeal. The All the events you described that led to OCD were the ordeal. But when you come into the ordeal, you almost always have to find a mentor in order to make it through it because the transformation of the individual from their belief systems to their behaviors to the way they live and relate to themselves and others is usually so significant. It takes someone who has the wisdom to really understand where they're at and how to get them there. So, you know, for example, if you look at uh, martial artists and great fighters, uh, Mike Tyson came from a very traumatic background as a child. His ordeal was that he really was in a, in a dangerous environment where he where there's a lot of violence and he didn't feel safe, but ultimately found boxing as an outlet for his uh, his trauma and his trapped energy. But his coach became his mentor, and his coach guided him through the ordeal, but he had not completed the individuation process when his coach died. And lo and behold, we all know Mike Tyson fell back into the ordeal, but was not healed enough to navigate the world without really seriously destroying his life. I mean, he went from being the highest paid athlete in the world to broke in a very short period of time once he lost his coach. So the, 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 or, the departure leads to the ordeal, which means finding a mentor, which then the third phase is the return where once a person has done the integration work and has become the person they needed to be through the hero's journey, the weight of the knowledge that they have and the wisdom that they have is so heavy that there's a real burden of it, which in tarot is archetype number nine, the hermit. Once the hermit spends enough time mastering their craft, healing themselves and learning, the weight of knowledge is so heavy they have to come down the mountain or the weight of the knowledge will literally break the branches of self. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, here you are, after having come down the mountain of your own ordeal, found the mentor, and now look how much you have to offer all your clients who are going through these types of problems. Right. And a lot of these, just these issues at first are quite unconscious. And yes. in, order for tap to, in order to tap into that unconscious, you really need the mentor as a trail guide. And as the trail guide being you took me into my own unconscious, I then was able to bring what was stored in the unconscious up into the conscious. And now kind of like circling back home. Now I act as the trail guide for my clients as well. So these heroes journeys definitely come full circle. They do. Hi everyone. Hippocrates said a wise man should consider that health is the greatest of human blessings and learn by his own thought to derive benefit from his illness. I couldn't have said it better myself. Holistic Lifestyle Coach Level 1 is a course I designed for the public so they could learn highly practical methods for improving their health immediately. 
It expands on the key teachings of my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, and gives you much more. Angie Check, nutritionist and highly qualified shaman, co-teaches this amazing course with me. And of the many things you'll learn, you'll learn all about how to work with your body to identify the right diet for your personal needs, and you'll be amazed how you feel when you let your own body guide you to health. In all the many years I've offered this course, I've never had anything but excellent feedback. Now is your chance to get healthy, vital, and share your love with the world. You can get this online now at chekinstitute.com forward slash HLC1 online. Listeners of Living 4D will receive $100 off. Yes, that is $100 off. With the whole coronavirus pandemic, we want to give you every opportunity to get healthy and vital and learn from the illnesses of man. On checkout, use the code L4DHLC, all small case, no caps. That's L4DHLC. This is sure to be the best investment you'd ever made in yourself or your family. I hope you enjoy it, and as always, love your feedback. One thing I I didn't mention earlier I'd like to share because it's important is that not only can you have these injuries from psychedelics, but you can have them from medical drugs and in your case, surgical traumas or physical traumas or family traumas. But uh, some people have these challenges in their genes. I've worked with a number of people that have a history of schizophrenia in, in the family lineage, history of depression, history of anxiety. So sometimes it's not that somebody's uh, come from parents that did not provide a secure attachment. It's not that they're, doing anything wrong. It's just that their genetic weak link has, has its roots right in part of their anatomy or their genetics that links to their psyche. And yeah. so the weak link, if it's, if you're not managing yourself well enough, then, you know, the strong, the chain is only as strong as the weakest link. Right. So oftentimes it's really something that they have to do the work to heal. And by healing it, it actually can free all the people coming forward in the family. So the, their children and their brothers and sisters, children, anybody coming forward, if anyone in the family heals it, it greatly reduces the chances of it recapitulating itself. Because when we heal that within ourselves, all the experiences that we're having in the healing process are actually being communicated to the morphogenic field where the information that guides the growth and development of all the people in that gene line is at. And and for those of you that aren't familiar with that, you can look at to the work of Rupert Sheldrake on morphogenic Mm -hmm. fields, Mm -hmm. which is now very well established through a lot of scientific research and even books like Mark Wu Lin's book. Um, It didn't start with you, I believe is the title, isn't it? That's a great one. And that one really shows the ancestral traumas, especially with uh, Holocaust survivors and how, those traumas really get passed down through the generations and trigger a lot of these psychological challenges such as anxiety. And he shows how his work, really just the awareness of showing his patients that these aren't their traumas. These aren't, this isn't their anxiety. This has been stuff that's been passed down through generations. So just that awareness can kind of give you a level of separation from it. Yes. And one of the things I wanted to bring up too is one of the big challenges with using psychedelic drugs, now commonly called plant medicines to kind of get the drug concept out of there, is that as the default mode network begins to break down its filtration capacity and more and more information is rising, the first thing we come into contact with is our personal unconscious. Mm -hmm. And that's all the stuff we've repressed. The next layer would be the family unconscious or that which is contained in your genetic line, which can go back <laughs> all the way to Adam and Eve. But uh, really, usually, in my experience, it's usually, as Mark Wulin says, not too much further than four generations. I've done a lot of past life regression work on people, and usually the challenges are in the past one to four lifetimes that I've found. But... Once we go through the personal unconscious, we can enter into the collective unconscious. And that's basically the unconscious of the planet where all the 
experiences of every living creature from microorganisms all the way to human beings is stored. And that includes not only the positive experiences, but the very, very dangerous and scary negative experiences, such as volcanoes going off and entire tribes or groups of people being wiped out, earthquakes. Every single trauma that's ever happened on this planet is recorded in the collective unconscious. And if you take enough of a drug like LSD, DMT, mushrooms, ayahuasca, you can pass through your personal unconscious into the collective unconscious. And I'll tell you, if you don't have uh, big balls and paratrooper (laughs) training to keep your focus and learn how to manage yourself or a very skilled shaman that really knows what you're doing and can track you, the experience can be so utterly traumatic that it can turn a person literally into a mental case. And and how do I know? Not only have I worked with people that have had this experience, but in my own work with plant medicines, for many years I did research on myself because I had so many people having these kinds of problems. I had to really say, okay, what are they really going through? I have to use myself as a guinea pig. So I progressively took myself to higher and higher doses until I literally began to crack up psychically and found myself penetrating the collective unconscious. And I even went through to the universal unconscious, which was uh, you know, mind boggling, too much to really get into here. It's mm-hmm. even hard for the human mind to conceive because you come into contact with archetypes that we don't normally associate with. But these are very, very real things. And there's very few people out there that really understand what's going on. And as you know, you go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a doctor, and next thing you're you're on, you know, some kind of antidepressive drug or any of the standard medications used for psychological disorders or behavioral disorders, but they dampen people so much and they also have very, very toxic effects on the body. And, and unfortunately, there's a high rate of suicide using those drugs if a person does not maintain the dose or tries to come off of them too quickly. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. What do you feel some of the main contributors are to the elevating rates of many of the commonly diagnosed psychological conditions uh, that we are experiencing today as well as OCD? Well, first and foremost, I feel as though stress is a big one. And the pace at which we're living at right now is much faster than we've ever experienced before. And the rate at which we're consuming information is higher than we've ever experienced in the past. So I feel as though, one, a lot of our culture and society is almost stuck in this sympathetic fight or flight state, which really has poor cognitive effects in the sense that there's not great integration between the left and the right hemispheres of the brain. Um, We're very much stuck in the left brain. There's not much creativity. There's not much open-minded thinking. There's not much holistic thinking. And also the overstimulation from technology, I think, is really contributing very quickly as well, where I find the overexposure to screens to be very depleting of neurotransmitters. I feel as though the stimulation and the ability to almost numb yourself out anytime, anywhere with these cell phones and gadgets is very disruptive to the brain and disruptive to our connection to our own emotions. Yes. I I feel as though um, our educational system is very much contributing as well in the sense that it's strictly thinking based and it completely disregards sensation, feeling, emotion, intuition. And when when there's this over identification with the mind and the thoughts and there's no space between your sense of self and your general thinking pattern, that creates a lot of issues in the sense that We don't have the ability to rise above the thought patterns that are streaming through our minds constantly. So once we are identified with these patterns, it can create a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, a lot of obsessive compulsive tendencies. And then also there's the dietary piece. There's the gut microbiome. We see a lot of research now that is directly relating the brain to the gut through the vagus nerve. And most people are talking about the brain's influence on the gut, 
But really, the gut's influence on the brain is also equally as important. I mean, we know, for example, I think it's 80% of serotonin is produced by our gut bacteria. And the number one medication used for these um, situations are SSRIs, which are really um, just working on the serotonin in the brain. So if someone's gut microbiome is disrupted and they're not producing a lot of these neurotransmitters, it can really create a lot of symptoms that we're talking about. And also just from a basic dietary piece, for example, like anxiety, we see um, a lot of poor management of blood sugar. So the overconsumption of processed carbohydrates is a real issue. Um, Eating a lot of inflammatory foods like gluten, dairy, vegetable oils, processed sugar, things like that. Um, There's a big connection between depression and neural inflammation. That's really coming from the diet because a lot of these a lot of these foods can cross the blood brain barrier and cause a lot of inflammation in the brain. Um, Yes, and then really just. One thing that I found was huge was eating a lot of um, commercially raised and factory farmed animals. I found that to be um, a huge contributor to cognitive dysfunction, anxiety, and even mood swings. So there's so many there's so many factors outside of just the biochemistry of the brain that can go into a lot of these issues, and a lot of them actually just start with the body and start with the environment. So environmental yeah. toxicity, EMFs, things like that can really have a huge effect on a lot of these issues. Yes. And a couple of things that came to my mind while you were sharing there is one of the things that goes hand in hand with all the electromagnetic pollution, which is, you know, millions of times higher now than it was even a hundred years ago. I mean, I've seen the statistics. Robert O. Becker in his book, The Body Electric, gave a statistic. And I think that book was written about 1989. And I think he, I'm guessing, but I think he said it was like, at that time, we were experiencing 1000 times more electromagnetic stress from electromagnetic pollution than we were 100 years ago. But some of the uh, books and and reports I've looked at recently, we're we're now saying it's up in like the million times higher. Mm -hmm. Um, But with that, uh, we have more and more people than ever, not only living in cities, but wearing shoes. And sleeping in electromagnetically jacked up environments, and they never are getting grounded. They're not touching right. their feet, their bare feet on the earth, right. or using grounding mat technologies. So all this energy gets trapped in their body. And a good way to uh, for people that don't really understand the concept of energy getting trapped in your body or grounding, a good way to think of it is some of you have had the experience of pulling a sweater or a shirt out of the dryer and it's got so much static electricity that it'll literally shock you and zap you. Well, that that is an analogy for what happens when you're sitting in a building, for example, with a wireless system or you're near electrical equipment or microwave ovens or any number of sources of electromagnetic pollution from the circuits in the walls of the buildings to the computer or the phone you're using And that energy gets trapped inside of our body and it builds up. And if it doesn't have a way to get out, so when you pick up the sweater out of the dryer, you're becoming the grounding circuit for the excess energy. And that's why there's a spark that jumps from it to you. But if we don't ground ourselves and let that energy bleed out of us, then all of our systems get overly excited and that's when we have to remember that the word disease actually means dis-ease, too much excitation. Mm-hmm. And that goes right back to the law, a physiological law called the Arndt Schultz law. The Arndt Schultz law, which can be found in the older versions of uh, Dorlin Medical Dictionary, which is still very true, says weak stimuli activate physiological processes, moderate stimuli favor them and strong stimuli inhibit them. So with that in mind, consider that I once read a research report by a scientist named Ross Addy, who pointed out that the signal strength of a cell phone, when you're holding a cell phone to your head, talking on it, the amount of current running through the cell phone, and if it'll go right through your head if you're standing in a building. For example, if you're standing in a building and the phone's on your right ear and the left ear is toward the window, the circuit will 
go through the window because the metal of the building is blocking the signal. Addy showed that the signal strength is one million times stronger than the, than the strength of the current that the brain cells use to communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. So this is why there's so much brain cancer coming from cell phones. But to put that into perspective, I tell people when I'm giving them this explanation, say like I'm sitting with a client coaching them or you people listening to me right now, ask yourself this question, what would happen if the volume on the phone you're using or the listening device you're using to hear us talk right now was suddenly to jump up 1 million times. Mm -hmm. Well, quite frankly, it would blow your eardrums out, probably dismantle your body and destroy the building. It would be as strong as an earthquake. It would be enough to literally vibrate the place into dust. So when you really understand what we're playing with here, it becomes really, really important to realize that when we don't get our feet on the earth and ground ourselves in the environment we're in, it can cause the body to go into a state of dis-ease and it will find your genetic weak link. It will overheat your body. It will trigger global inflammation. It will disrupt blood sugar handling. It will disrupt growth and repair because it keeps you in a sympathetic fight or flight state and therefore reflexively inhibits the parasympathetic growth and repair system. And it leads to all sorts of mental, emotional disorders. It leads to poor sleep. It leads to all the problems that we have with sleep deprivation and much more, right. which is why it's such a big issue. Another thing I wanted to share, Greg, in regard to you know some of the causes for all these mental, emotional challenges is that um, we have... Um, we, we really have a problem in our culture. We've lost all the elders. Mm -hmm. The elders now are just like big kids chasing after more toys. And, and unfortunately, we've lost res our culture has very little respect for old people. We treat them like bumps on a log. But in traditional native cultures, the elders were the ones that guided the young people through their rite of initiation. So men had to go through, young men had to go through a, a, an initiation ceremony where they became men. And these ceremonies were often extremely, extremely challenging and dangerous and brought them right to the edge of death. Women's initiation, of course, is giving birth. So the women prepared the young women to give birth, and the process of giving birth was their initiation into adulthood and motherhood. But we now have so many games going on in that women are often avoiding the birth process because they're on birth control pills. So they never actually go through what a tribal woman would have gone through. So they actually don't have to go through the type of pain and ordeal that leads to a real initiation process. And the men are really just boys in adult bodies. And so what we see is this booming rush for people to run off into the jungle and get their minds blown with psychedelics and approach death that way, or to work the living hell out of themselves in CrossFit or kettlebell training or get into martial arts and boxing and beat each other up, which is all, I believe, an unconscious drive to prove to themselves that they can survive the rigors of the world. And if a person doesn't have adequate support, then they end up getting into situations that are far too, too traumatic for them to handle and doing things like driving cars drunk or stoned, and next thing you know, they're in the hospital and they've killed someone or killed their friends or permanently disabled themselves or running off to the military to, to be a badass, not realizing that near not not even really having any comprehension of the rigors of a battlefield or or what they're even really fighting for and how politically corrupt all that is. Right. And I've worked with many guys that have come back from the desert desert storm in these areas with serious OCD. And mm -hmm. one of the traumatic facts they were dealing with is they really were very, very disheartened when they came to the realization that what we were fighting for was not a threat to the United States public, but it was a manufactured threat. And it was ultimately a ploy to use military power to steal resources from other countries and when they come to the realization that they've been duped, it can be very emotionally traumatic. Hi, everybody. You know, anyone wanting to manage stress, reduce inflammation, and calm their body-mind will find One Farm's CBD products excellent. 
Today, there are loads of research papers scientifically demonstrating the mental health benefits of THC, cannabinoids, and other marijuana derivatives. And I know this is true from my own personal research, which was fun. I found organic, sun-grown marijuana, CBD oil, and their synergists to be very helpful to me in times of high mental-emotional stress. And I know of no better, cleaner, high-quality source of such products than One Farm. One Farm's products are full spectrum. They include THC other canna- and the other cannabinoids to maintain the functional synergy of the plant and its healing powers. The products they have available are many, but the ones I'd like to share with you today are C- their CBD oil tinctures, which range in doses from 10 micrograms a serving to 40 micrograms a serving and come in natural mint, cinnamon, and lemon flavors. One of my favorite products from One Farm is their water-soluble hemp extract without flavoring, which comes in a 20 microgram dose. And this is one of the key products that I tested of theirs, and I was absolutely amazed at how I felt within a split second of it hitting my mouth. I could literally feel it going through my body and calming me immediately. They also have soft gel edibles at 20 micrograms per serving. To get your check 15% discount, go to https colon double forward slash. So that's forward slash forward slash onefarm.com forward slash check. That's https colon forward slash forward slash onefarm.com forward slash check. That's C-H-E-K, by the way. Once you click on that link, it will automatically enter your 15% discount code on checkout. You don't have to do anything else. Hope you enjoy these products. I absolutely love them. If you go to their website and look at the film they show of how they run their farm, it's just gorgeous, super clean, super beautifully run. They do everything. Every aspect of it is done by their staff. And uh, really, I'm just totally in love with their products. I wouldn't share them with you if I wasn't. So enjoy. And as always, I love your feedback. Yeah. And a few things that was coming to me when you were sharing is, number one, when you were talking about the tribal initiation is simply just having a sense of belonging and a sense of community. And we've really lost that over the years. And that can be very anxiety provoking and trigger a lot of these issues when you just don't have that sense of belonging or sense of community. And another thing when you were talking about the technology is With the growing social media, whenever we go and check our phone and we receive these notifications on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, that triggers a dopamine response in the brain. And the more and more we get addicted to that response, the more and more those receptors get dulled out and they get numbed out and they need more and more of a stimulus for you to feel that same effect. So when we are not having that cell phone in our hand or that buzz going off or that Instagram check or that like we wanted to receive from our last post, we actually almost have this rebound effect that can almost create like a level of depression and anxiety when we're not kind of getting that hit, so to speak, like it's a drug. And then lastly, when you were talking about grounding yourself A lot of these psychological issues, if you look at the four elements of earth, water, fire, and air, a lot of these issues, there is an excessive presence of the air elements to the point where you feel like the wind's just blowing you around. And the the air elements is is associated with the mind. So simply just grounding yourself and getting barefoot on the earth gives you a dose of the earth elements, which really balances them out. So even yes, aside it, from just the electromagnetic pollution, just getting your bare feet on the ground just has a grounding effect and really pulls a lot of that air element out of you a little bit. Yes. You know, another part of this whole sociocultural challenge, two things. One that came up while you were talking is that just as people get a dopamine hit, if they do get criticism for what they've shared or attacked, which as you know, is brutal out there on, on these social media networks, because people are, are, are a lot more destructive than they would be standing face to face with someone that can punch them right in the head or punish them for that kind of behavior. So we get this unbridled, uh, sort of, uh, dysfunctional adolescent teenage behavior in communication. But what happens is when they get criticized or put down, they get 
a huge rush of adrenaline and cortisol because they feel as though they're being attacked and threatened. And as you know, psychologically, the brain does not differentiate from a perceived threat to an actual threat. Mm -hmm. So you have this this huge yo-yo between dopamine hits and adrenaline hits. Mm -hmm. And that right there sets a person up for bipolar type experiences where they're going from one extreme to the other. And so many people live on these social media systems these days that they're oscillating back and forth from reward to threat, reward to threat. And it creates the illusion that the world is actually that way in their head, when in reality, person-to-person communications are typically not nearly as polarized because we all have an innate sense that we have to be careful that we don't say or do things that could get us harmed. So we're mm-hmm. a little bit more well self-managed and, and, and more aware of um, ethics and manners. But mm-hmm. as you know, on the social media forms, all that just goes out the window. Yeah, but also we talk about getting addicted to the dopamine hit. You can also get addicted to the conflict in the sense like if you take someone who's chronically fatigued, that conflict actually gives them a boost in cortisol. So yes. it can actually make them feel alive where without the conflict, they kind of feel dead or they kind of feel tired. So it can actually give them a sense of energy, even though it's coming from an unhealthy resource or source such as conflict. So it can go both it- ways. Yes, it can. And, and, and this reminds me of Carl Jung's very potent quote, no man is fully alive until he has the power to destroy himself. Mm-hmm. So when we're bouncing back and forth between these extremes, the extremes of the negative can be very destroying to the personality or one's sense of self. And if at the same time the person is unhealthy, they're their physiological systems, their cells, their glands, their organs also feel they're dying. Mm-hmm. So there's this real, there's this real unconscious realization at some level that I'm on the edge of self-destruction. And that level of adrenaline is kind of like living the life of a Navy SEAL who's mm-hmm. in a battlefield or in a dangerous situation with terrorists and real bullets are flying, but people can't differentiate how much of that is really just in the idea sphere or the sphere of mind versus actual reality, i.e., how would it be if you lived a normal human life with human relationships versus this illusory life of internet relationships? Absolutely. One other factor that's involved that's not often considered here is that we're in a myth transition right now. We've come out of some of the we're, we, you know, we're, there's still a large population of, of people trapped in, in fundamentalist religious mythology, which would be typical biblical or uh, Judaism or Islamic myths, which we all know about from watching the news and all the things related to terrorism and jihads and, and the history of crusades and religion and all that. But we moved out of that into consumerism. And so people begin to medicate the stress of a dysfunctional Christian or religious mythological system that wasn't interfacing with the world by being sucked into spending more money than they have and trying to medicate their pain by buying clothes, cars, gadgets, toys, houses, anything to create this illusion of social status and safety and security, which is now destroying the planet. And so we're all facing this you know the potential catastrophe of the uh, catastrophe of the entire planet due to excessive consumerism and so we're in a counter myth where we're having to deal with all the trauma and all the destruction and it's very very overwhelming for people when they start watching documentaries and seeing how nature's almost dying and we're killing more animal species and we're there's still you know small skirmishes and genocide going on all over the world and we've got people like Donald Trump wanting to build walls and act racist and segregate when at the deeper level, we all know that this is actually the path to further destruction and potentially complete annihilation. So there's a lot of young people being born in the world today, whether they be indigo children, crystal children, rainbow children, that are souls that are coming into the world to help us transition into a a new myth. And, And that myth is going to have to be one that's more of a return back to the 
myths that would be more akin to paganism where we worship mother nature. And if you study the history of religion, there was a time when we worshiped trees as gods. We actually thought that trees were God because so much life and food and shelter was provided by trees. We thought that fire was God. We thought that snakes were God because everywhere in nature that we looked, we saw rivers move like snakes and wind made snake-like patterns in the sand and tree trunks grew with this sort of serpentine type pattern. Nothing in nature is straight. Then we worship fire as God, and we worship the sun as God. Now, all of these things are the things that we're destroying. So the point I'm driving at is a lot of the young people are coming in much more open to the subtle dimensions and to the archetypal dimensions. And so you get somebody like Alex Gray that's channeling in the imagery, Mm -hmm. or you get young musicians that are channeling in music that moves us and, and activates our soul and creates huge senses of connection. So you saw the rave rage where people would get together, do ecstasy and dance all night and have tremendous union experiences with thousands of people at a time. So the point I'm driving at is one of the big crises that I see, and this is part of the psychedelic crazes, people are desperate for solutions that really love life and love the earth. And so they're trying to find ways to help. But a lot of people are open, like the artists, the poets, And the musicians are to the flow of archetypal information as we're making an archetypal transition. And what can happen is they get caught between this world and that world where they're having a hard time integrating the inflow of cosmic and earthly information to guide us into a new myth and the pain of being trapped in an old myth. And whenever people like that start talking about it, about their experiences or about um, what they, what they're visioning or you listen to the lyrics of their music, they often get attacked by people as weirdos or told that they're never going to be successful or treated as though there's some kind of social misfits. And that leads to a real painful firewalk for these young people that are actually the ones that are here to go through and lead us through this archetypal transition. Because, you know, as Einstein said, um, uh, new ideas are first violently opposed, then they are used with scorn, and finally they are accepted as if they always existed. (laughs) And as a guy who's initiated many pioneering ideas, I've been through the harsh scorn, I've been through the use with scorn, and I've been through the acceptance as though it always existed. You know, for me, I walk into gyms all over the world with Swiss balls, and even though I'm the guy that really initiated the whole concept of using Swiss balls in gyms and develop the first educational information. Not a person has a clue who I am or what my connection is to the Swiss ball. And I've often had trainers come accuse me of being dangerous on a Swiss ball and telling me I can't do certain exercises. And I giggle and say, why don't you go look up the name Paul check on the internet and come back and tell me what you find. And some of them have done it and been downright embarrassed. But the point is the people that have to bear the brunt like I did. When I first started using Swiss balls in gyms, I had people downright coming and telling me I was a fag. I was an idiot. What are you doing with that colored ball in here? Mm -hmm. uh, Gym owners would try to kick me out of gyms, take the ball away. I got violently attacked for a long time. And, and, And same with when I was a vegetarian, same with when I started wearing Tai Chi pants, same with when I let people know I had two wives and the list just goes on. The point I'm driving at is there's a lot of people coming into the world and that are in the world right now that are in their teens and early 20s that are actually the healers that have come to the planet, but they have unfortunately got to go through the beating of a sociocultural transition and the beating of being a pioneer and having new and novel ideas that go against the habitual patterns of the unconscious programming that's got us in trouble in the first place. And if those people don't find healthy mentors like Czech professionals, people like yourself, myself, and some of the other leaders in our our culture today, then they end up being uh, people that potentially end up in psych wards and in straitjackets and on heavy drugs and uh, on the street as social misfits. Absolutely. And a lot of this boils down to an over-identification with the mind. And Absolutely. our educational system sets it up in the sense that, obviously I was talking about earlier, being so thinking dominant 
that when you're so stuck in your head and so attached to the mind, one, you become disconnected to the body. So when you become disconnected to the body, you become disconnected from feeling. You become disconnected from emotions. And thinking and feeling are antagonists. So the more you think, the less you feel. And when you become disconnected from the body, you also become disconnected from really the collective body, which is the earth. So yes. a lot of what's going on in the food system and the environment and the um, telecommunication industry, like a lot of that is just that level of disconnection. Yeah, the way I describe those people, for those of you that have ever flown a kite, if you take the tail off of a kite, you ever float, tried to fly a kite, Greg, with no tail on it? <laughs> Thankfully not, but I can imagine what would happen. <laughs> well, what happens is it just goes everywhere. It just mm -hmm. one minute it's going straight up in the air, the next minute it goes straight down and nose dives right into the ground and just destroys yeah. itself. The 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 kite has to have a tail for the same reason a, a boat or a ship has to have a rudder. So when we're too in our minds and we disconnect from our bodies, the mind moves faster than the speed of light. That's scientific fact. Thought moves faster than the speed of light. So we're actually in this field of ideas with no awareness as to whether or not they're actually feasible in the reality of the earth plane that we're in. So people's minds are jumping all over the place. In fact, Steiner said the first thing that happens when you die is you find yourself bouncing around the universe at the speed of light until you realize it's your mind and you calm your mind. Mm -hmm. So this is why all spiritual traditions are really teaching you to die before you die. And those practices are an integration of the body, mind, spirit, and soul. So that when a person actually physically dies, they can handle the freedom of the body because what's left is a light body that moves at the speed of thought. Mm -hmm. And when we have so many people that are actually dying a physical death while they're in their body, but do not have any training and how to manage and use their mind effectively, then their mind, which is the greatest tool of freedom, becomes the greatest threat to their well-being and their freedom. Well, there's the air element with no earth element. Exactly. That's the kite without the string. Yes, without the tail. Without the tail. Um, you know, Greg, being a Czech professional and having worked uh, directly with me as your therapist and holistic lifestyle coach for over two years, what do you feel it is that I that was in the approach that I guided you through that differed from the other approaches you'd tried or that are typically being used to attempt to resolve such of the, the kinds of disorders that we're talking about today. In other words, what is it, what was it that I guided you through and the tools that I gave you that's different than what's going on traditionally out there? If you want to share some of those approaches that we used. Well, to start, is really the six foundation principles, which is nutrition, hydration, sleep, breathing, thinking, and movement. So really getting those foundational principles well established before even addressing the OCD um, has profound effects. But aside from that, one of the biggest themes that I really noticed that really differed was when I worked with traditional therapists, it was really, all right, you have OCD, let's get rid of it. Let's move away from it. So the OCD almost became the enemy. And when I worked with you, it was a total paradox in the sense that it was like, all right, let's go right into this freaking thing. And <laughs> let's, Paratrooper. Let's, yeah, let's not get rid of it, but let's use it as a catalyst for physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual growth. And almost allow the OCD to be your spirit guide and to be your greatest teacher rather than something to get rid of. It's something to learn and grow from. And that was probably the biggest shift um, really in perspective and perception that created, um, that allowed me to see kind of a light at the end of the tunnel where when it felt like something I was supposed to get rid of, that there was a constant conflict. And there's like the old saying, what you resist persists. And yes. the biggest thing was stopping the resistance to the flow of the OCD. It's kind of like, if you think of repeating thought patterns and the mind almost like waves in the ocean, someone yes. who has OCD is constantly swimming against the tide. 
And when you're constantly swimming against the tide, you're going to burn out and drown. And a lot of the traditional approach of let's get rid of it is constantly swimming against the tide. Where when I worked with you, you gave me the tools and techniques to not swim against the tide, but to learn how to surf the waves. And when you learn how to surf the waves, you actually learn how to rise above these thought patterns. And you can actually simply witness them and ride them and learn from them. And they really don't become something to get rid of, but something to fully engage. So that was really the main theme. And obviously, like, we worked on diet, we worked on sleep and breathing and gut health, and really, obviously, taking the holistic approach that all your listeners know you take. But really, the perspective that I shared earlier was really the main theme that created a lot of change for me. Hi, everybody. I'm super excited to share one of my favorite Symbiotica products called the Omega. This is an amazing product. When I tried it the first time and every time, I found it very calming and very centering. And the immediate thought I had is that this product is great for people that are under a lot of stress and have busy minds. So I asked Shervin to come tell us what's unique about this amazing product, the Omega. Well, the fish oil industry is running havoc across the world, destroying our mother nature and providing oxidized omega-3 oils to so many people that just don't know. So a lot of the fish is toxic too. Super toxic. I mean, you're getting homeopathic doses of mercury, heavy metals, pesticides, plastics. I can go on and on if you understand homeopathy, which you do. And so we wanted to circumvent that. And guess what? Fish don't make DHA and EPA. They don't synthesize it. They're eating little sea creatures that are feeding on microalgae. Right. So what did we do? We went to the cleanest place on earth, Nova Scotia, to extract a wild heirloom strain of algae with warm water. So it's still intact. It's still alive. And from there, we took other microalgaes, including one called astaxanthin, which we now know is the strongest antioxidant on earth. You know, it's that pigment that makes flamingos pink yes. or makes salmon red. Yeah. So we get that directly sourced from Iceland. You can see it in all my videos, me going through the whole grow facility. It's incredible stuff. I didn't stop there. We added organic lemon terpenes. We added phosphatidylcholine. We we used organic sea buckthorn oil, which is omega-3, 6, 7, and 9. This is one powerhouse omega product, never been done before. This is a flagship to Symbiotica, and it's an honor to be able to provide this product to so many mothers and children and everyone across the board. Yes. In fact, you know, my son's a high energy kid that doesn't like to sleep at night. So one of the first things that come out of the refrigerator is the omega to calm my mana down. And mana means life force. So, hey, you guys, this is really top-notch stuff. I love it. I feel fantastic when I use it. So get on over to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com. And on checkout, use your code, capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, uh, 15. That's check 15 to get your discount. And while you're there, check out all the other absolutely amazing products. And as always, love to hear your feedback. Yes, and we we did a lot of work with, that most people maybe have heard about, but they don't really realize. For example, we did power animal retrieval and spirit guide retrieval. So I took you into your body, and mm-hmm. and you know a power animal is really a psychological personification of, shall we say, the energy and the consciousness that is within any part of our body. So there, if I say, well, let's go find the power animal of your heart. So the overall energy and information of the heart, which has an intelligence all its own, that's actually informing the brain all the time. By meeting the power animal of a heart, you get a psychic representation in the form of an animal that now the individual can actually consciously engage in a meditative process, this power animal. And since the heart is really the home of the experience of love, when we don't trust our own judgments or our own opinions, or we're full of fear, we can then say, I wonder what the elephant in my heart has to say about this or the dove in my heart. And though this is a psychological technique it's very, very powerful and it's very real. It's been used in shamanism for thousands of years because it really does work. Yeah. Now, a lot of people think, you go yeah. ahead. 
No, no, I was just going to say one of the beauties of doing the power animal work is one, it stimulates the imagination. It integrates, obviously, the left and the right brain, but also it brings the inner child out. And yes. when you bring the inner child out to play and the healing starts to feel more like play than work, the ego gets to kind of take a little rest because it doesn't feel threatened. And when the child comes out to play and the ego goes to sleep, that's when you can actually kind of create a lot of these new neural networks and a lot of the changes that need to be made on kind of the level of the minds and the brain. So you meet a lot less resistance when you're working in that realm than your traditional approach. Yes, and 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 this comment about the child is very important because one of the disasters that's happened with putting kids in school at such early ages and and educating them from a mathematical logical perspective, which Steiner warned should not be done until a child is seven to ten years of age, because the right brain hemisphere it comes online first of the child and it progressively integrates with the left brain hemisphere from about the age four to five to seven or eight. So Steiner said kids should not be exposed to memorization and mathematical logical concepts until they're around 10 years of age. Otherwise, it disrupts the normal integration of the brain. Mm -hmm. But when we have all this scholastic pressure and kids identifying them, their sense of self-worth and parents responding to report cards either with great scorn or uh, great acceptance, it polarizes the child to begin to not only feel that if they don't get good grades, then they're not going to be loved, which is very scary. But as you know, the mathematical, logical approach to learning, which it actually turns out to be the vehicle of teaching in 98% of all educational systems on this planet, yet we the mathematical logical learning style only accounts for 8% of human beings based on Howard Gardner's research, who is an expert on these topics. And the most dominant learning system is visual. The second most dominant is auditory and the third is kinesthetic. So, you know, what do people spend most of their time doing today? Looking at screens and listening to podcasts because that suits their learning style. But when you go to a school and you're forced to read books and memorize facts and figures, most kids' brains are just not well designed for that. And so what happens is they begin to identify not only themselves, but their social hierarchy, who's the cool kid, who's the one that's smart, becomes the people that are oriented toward mathematical, logical reasoning. Meanwhile, you've got some young uh, Kobe Bryant who may not be very uh, mathematically, logically inclined, but is a kinesthetic genius. And somebody like that could be the greatest athlete in the world whose self-esteem is thrown out the window. And ultimately, that can lead to a real psychological crisis for a child. Because if the parents are too demeaning of them, I remember being a kid scared to death to bring my report card home. I knew mm -hmm. damn well that if my father saw a D or an F, which for me, being a very kinesthetic and visual child, I hated school. And I got great grades in physical education, and I got great grades in the class I classes I enjoyed, like biology or auto mechanics or things like that. But I hated English. I hated social studies. I hated anything that I couldn't see how I could use it. And so, you know, for me, I could get the hell beat out of me for a report card like that. So, yeah. report card time was a time in my life when my stomach was just tied in nuts and knots, and I was thinking, how in the hell can I? trick my parents into thinking I got better because the, the risk of getting caught doing that is far less risky than what's going to happen yeah. when they find out I got an F in, uh, you know, English class or English composition or something like that. Yeah. So it's this whole, all this academic, um, drive. In fact, uh, years ago when I was doing research into the high rates of teenage suicide, I found that the highest rates of suicide, teenage suicide in the world were in Japan. Second, second was in New Zealand. And the researchers tracked it right back to scholastic standards and peer pressure between children and peer pressure from teachers. 
And lo and behold, the two countries with the highest academic standards in high school in the world were Japan, number one, and New Zealand, number two. Mm. So the researchers concluded that all the suicide was because kids were now identifying themselves and their sense of self-worth by the grades they were getting. And if they couldn't maintain high enough grades, they felt like social outclasses or misfits and would rather die. Yeah, and a lot of and this also are, um, boils back to the thinking, feeling, sensation, and intuition. Where absolutely. When it's such a thinking dominant education, thinking and feeling being antagonists, you numb out feeling. The more you think, the less you feel. And then with sensation and intuition, the more overly stimulated our senses are, especially this day and age with the growing technology, the more we numb out our own intuition. Absolutely. So, so yeah, there's the over-identification with the minds again. Yes. Now, as you know, I approach each individual as an individual. In the Czech Institute training, we inform students that we don't treat the disease that has the patient. We coach the person that has acquired the disease. We evaluate people individually, physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. Our work together included a lot of work to balance your body, correct your posture. We used exercise to integrate your body mind before we ventured into traditional strength development or conditioning methods. What have you learned in dealing with your own OCD and working with others with these various psychological diagnoses or disorders with regard to addressing the body as a bottom-up approach? So in taking a bottom-up approach, the first thing that I would say is the importance of stretching and mobilizing the body. And what I found is the more I stretched and foam rolled and did exercises such as Feldenkrais and various mobilizations, it almost felt as though I created more space inside of myself. There was more room to operate, even on a mental, emotional level. And when I wasn't stretching and mobilizing and the body became tight, it almost felt like you were, it almost felt like you were in a room where there was too much furniture and there was too much stuff in there. There was no room to operate. So the stretching and mobilizing almost felt like I was clearing the room out inside of myself and there was more room to do a lot of the mental emotional work that we were working on. And then secondly yes. is the importance of what you have classified as working in, which is using breathing and movement to stimulate the parasympathetic system, integrate the left and the right brain. And the importance of that with someone such as OCD or anxiety is sometimes if you go directly to the mind, you meet a lot of resistance. But if you go to the body and the breath, the breath and the mind always mirror each other. So if you can put someone in a meditative state by doing things such as Tai Chi, Qigong, zone exercises in your book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, you can actually create a change in the mind by actually just going directly to the body and working with the breath, because the breath is just the bridge between the mind and the body. And what I found also, in terms of healing the body, is when you can get into that state where the mind is perfectly still, and there's no mental activity, the body begins to recalibrate itself. And energy blockages start getting cleared up, and things kind of begin to balance out with really only just addressing the breath, the body, and the mind really in one, um, in one practice, such as your zone exercises, where you just harmonize breathing and movement, like the breathing squat or the energy push, things like that, that are in your book. So those were really powerful. And the importance of the breath and working with the mind is probably the most underrated tool that we have. And to me, the breathing is probably the most important anchor that we have when we're working with these issues because really the stress of the mind is when it takes you into the past or the future but you can only breathe in the present moment so if you're constantly connecting to your breath you're constantly connecting to the present moment and it's very hard to be stressed or anxious or depressed in that state um, a few other things is the importance of releasing the abdominal wall, the chest, and the hip flexors to open up that breathing is really important when our breathing gets very shallow and chest-oriented and mouth breathing. That has um, 
an effect that triggers the sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight system, which creates a lot of stress and anxiety. Um, with people with OCD, there's also a big tendency to overtrain. A lot of times exercise becomes actually a form of addiction to create that release valve, like we talked about earlier, when a lot of that um, emotional energy gets blocked. So there's a huge addiction to exercise with a lot of these people. And then finally, I also think the upper cervical spine and alignment of the atlas is really important for cognition as well. Um, we know the effect that has on the parasympathetic nervous system and the vagus nerve. And all that's really important when it comes to the function of the minds. Yes. And those are all things that we work with you on, you know, and, and that's one of the things I'd like to share. You know, when I start with a client, I won't even take anybody on that's not willing to uh, commit to at least a year of coaching because to really do honest healing work and to teach people new diet and lifestyle habits and how to have values and how to eat right for their individual needs, how to breathe and move properly, the science of rest and how to apply that properly. It's just a lot to learn. And it's such a radical shift in people's way of behaving, relating, choosing and acting. And a lot of people just have to grow up. As you know, a lot of people are just trapped in being a child and expecting doctors, therapists, mommies, daddies, and everybody else to do all the work for them. But to really heal from any kind of a crisis like we're talking about requires that one be willing to accept adult responsibility and as you know you know as the listeners are hearing and as you know very well there's a lot of uh ground we have to cover from diet you know all the four doctors and the six foundation principles a person has to really not you can't just tell people this stuff mm -hmm. otherwise you're just dealing with the mind again if they don't embody the practice, then their dysfunction will stay and they usually just blame the therapist. But in reality, they're not often doing their, their part, which is one of the reasons I'm very careful to screen people. And it's another reasons I didn't respond to your mother for quite a while because I'm like, okay, I get letters and calls like this all the time. But when I realized this woman is desperate, that triggered me to connect to my soul and I got the green light. And knew that, you know, you weren't going to be an exercise in professional babysitting and, and you did an excellent job, which made it fun for me. Each time I saw your name on my schedule, I'm like, cool, I, I get to work with Greg and we're, you know, because for me as a therapist, I always hold the position that I'm on the journey with you and I'm going to grow with you. I have to do research. I have to sometimes meditate on what kind of a technique can I help Greg with because he's in need of something that's different than what's in my toolbox. So I really, for each client I work with, I have to go into a growth cycle as well and do my work. So it's very frustrating as a therapist, if I'm doing my work to support the relationship, but they're acting like a child and wanting me to just fix them, you know, and that gets to be old hat. One of the things that popped into my mind while you were talking earlier is that one of the most overlooked healing forces for any kind of physical or emotional or mental challenge is sleep. Yeah. We spend so much time in our heads. And just like you said, when you're staying with your breath or you're doing a zone exercise or any of these things that bring you into the now, your mind calms down. But we all need sleep to do that. You don't need to memorize any zone exercise or Tai Chi movements or techniques or anything like that. When we go to sleep, the wisdom of our body does the healing and our psyche does its healing and dreams do it, their healing for us and give us messages that we need to grow and to heal. Mm -hmm. But we've got, you know, the average college student today only sleeps 4.7 hours a night. The average person is something like one to one and a half hours low on sleep per capita. And when you look at the devastating costs of injury and illness connected to sleep. It's a, a sleep deprivation. It's in the billions of dollars a year, multi-billions of dollars. So what, how did you find sleep? Uh, was How important was sleep to your healing process? Well, if you think of the mind as a computer, when you go to sleep, it's almost like the computer recalibrates itself and defragments itself and cleans itself. So Whenever I felt sleep deprived, I felt 
a lot more mental, emotional burden. My thought patterns were either sluggish or erratic. And I found when I was able to get good quality sleep, not just quantity, but quality, I found it had kind of a reboot effect on the mind. And a lot of the work that we were doing can be sort of uh, sort of integrated into the system on a deeper level, where if I was lacking sleep, I feel like I can do the work, but a lot of the tools weren't really getting solidified and integrated um, more in like an unconscious almost like the the level of the nervous system. So I really found the sleep almost to act as like a reboot for the computer system of the minds. Yeah. You know, I spend a lot of time, I I have a daily practice where I, I typically spend about the first hour of the day doing inner vision work, such as active imagination, astral travel, remote viewing, and, you know, working with, power animals and spirit guides and all the things that I teach, I practice. So what I find consistently is if I'm low on sleep, it's very hard for my clairvoyance to work. Mm -hmm. I have a hard time seeing into the other dimensions. And I often, it takes me a lot longer to get an image. It might take me 10 or 15 minutes to see, for example, my soul may manifest in a, uh, the form of, of a human being, such typically a woman most men's souls will manifest to them as women. Most um, women's souls will manifest to them as men um, due due to the fact that the opposite polarity is what completes us. So Mm -hmm. uh, a man doesn't need more guidance from masculine energy to complete himself. He needs feminine energy. So the, the, the male expression of the soul is called the anima. The female is the animus. And that's what Jung calls a psychopomp or a mediator between the conscious and the unconscious mind. But what I would find is that the degree of sleep deprivation that I was experiencing led to uh, more focus and a harder time getting inner imaging. And I think why this is important is because we all have, as you know very well, our soul is our inner guidance system. We have the whole universe inside of us. And if we get too sleep deprived or too externalized with our psyche or turn into human doings and don't spend enough time being human beings. Or as you and I've talked about, if you get too caught in the rational mind and avoid the unrational mind, then you actually lose contact with the mysteries and the magic of the soul and the universe that exists right inside of you. Yeah. And also when you're sleep deprived, remember sleep is basically the number one medicine for the body. So when you're deprived, the body is under a lot of stress. And when it comes to doing a lot of the psychic work, when the body is under stress, it ba- it's basically pulling you back in. And it makes, a, makes it a lot harder to engage these other realms. So when the body is under stress, it basically says, what are you doing going off and doing this astral travel? I need you right here. So Amen. Um, it's almost like a magnet that pulls you back in. It does the same thing in relationships too. If, for example, if a, if a mother is, is uh, spending too much time caring for other people, even though they may be her children and family, but she's got a disease process, whether she knows it or not, she can actually start begin to have real feelings of, of sadness, frustration, resent, isolation not realizing that her body is saying you need to stop taking all this time to take care of other people because you're going to die if you don't start taking care of yourself. So the next Mm -hmm. thing you know, they're at some doctor's office being put on antidepressants, not realizing that the fear and the anxiety that she's experiencing is her own cells trying to get her attention and bring her back to home base because we, you know, the basis of our ability to love other people is how well we care for and love ourselves. So if we don't honor that, and when we have this Judeo-Christian culture that sort of indoctrinates people into the concept of the body is bad, give it away, always sacrifice for other people, that's what Jesus did, then we we get very, very caught in a, uh, a misinterpretation of a mythological ideology that leads people right into religiously confused ways of relating that lead to a lot of physical, emotional, and mental trauma and health problems. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
Greg, you and I worked in concert with Dr. Cliff Oliver. We did extensive testing for parasites, fungal infections, leaky gut, food allergy, food intolerance, heavy metal toxicity, and other factors. You now have a lot of experience in recovering from OCD and working with clients as well as your studies on these issues. I'm curious to know how big of a role you feel the diet is in common psychological disorders from OCD to anxiety to depression to chronic challenges with dark and often suicidal thoughts that are so common today, particularly among younger people who uh, paradoxically are, are being younger, should be comparatively free of these challenges relative to people that have had more time to create imbalances in their bodies, such as adults with mm -hmm. poor dietary habits. Now, you did allude to that a little earlier. Uh, would you like to expand on these factors such as you know gut health, parasite, fungal infections, and uh, food intolerance and, and the kinds of things that you and I worked through and how they affected you? Yeah, so definitely with the diet, I would say number one would be, I think I alluded to this earlier, consuming too much processed carbohydrates or even carbohydrates in general. I found any extreme fluctuation in blood sugar to have a direct correlation with um, the state of the mind and the thoughts and the activity going on there. Also, one thing I had to do is I definitely had to get off of caffeine. I found caffeine yes. to be very stimulating, overly stimulating of the mind, the left brain. And with someone with OCD, OCD or anxiety, that's just really creating more of an imbalance there. Um, Commercially raised animal products such as um, factory farm meat, I found to have a huge effect on the mind. I noticed I would eat a commercially raised steak at a restaurant and all of a sudden I noticed like an increase in anxiety. I started to increase a lot of mental sluggishness, mental cloudiness, and inability to, um, to really think straight. So the commercially raised meats definitely have a huge effect. Um, and then any inflammatory foods that either are the common ones like gluten, dairy, sugar, vegetable oils, um, or anything that would show up on a food sensitivity test like a Cyrix lab. Um, I found anything that caused an inflammation response, one, to have definite effect on the brain. We know that we're now looking at depression as becoming really a source of like neural inflammation which can be directly related to the diet. But also there are subtle ways in which the diet can affect the state of the mind in the sense that I found when I ate something that would disrupt um, and upset my stomach and I would start getting bloated or gassy or um, distended, that would start to disrupt my breathing. And as soon as you disrupt the breathing, you have an effect on the mind and the psyche because the mind and the breathing mirror each other. So there's not only direct ways in which the diet affects the mind, but also indirect ways. And then we obviously know the connection of the gut microbiome to the brain. Um, we know the neurotransmitters are produced in the gut. We know the connection between the brain and the gut through the vagus nerve. So anything that nourishes the microbiome, fermented foods, um, if you can handle a lot of plant foods that feed the gut bacteria, that's great. A lot of times there are cases where it could actually make it worse. I found sometimes if I ate too much fiber um, and get any level of bacterial overgrowth, a lot of times the bacteria in the gut will produce chemicals such as like lipopo lipopolysaccharides or TMAO or a lot of toxins that can really disrupt the function of the brain. So keeping the gut microbiome is very important. Keeping the gut microbiome healthy is very important. And then another subtle factor that I noticed is when you consume foods that really disrupt the biochemistry of the body or disrupt the microbiome, it creates a lot of unwanted feelings and sensations in the body. And when I was talking about earlier with thinking and feeling being antagonists, when there's a lot of feeling and sensations in the body that we don't want to experience, we start generating thought patterns as a way of numbing them out. So the more still the mind becomes, the more you start feeling more. And if there's things that we don't want to feel or things we don't want to sense, a lot of times we'll get addicted to feel, 
addicted to thinking as a way of avoiding the feeling. So yes. when the body becomes more and more unhealthy, we actually start divorcing ourselves from the body and almost live from the neck up. And actually getting rid of the anxiety or getting rid of the OCD or getting rid of these excessive thought patterns and mental activity can actually expose us to the unhealthy body even more. So there's, there's so many ways and so many angles in which the diet and the body affect the mind that those are just, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And fortunately, there's a revival now of awareness of the microbiome and, and the vagus relationships to our uh, mental, emotional, and physical integration. And, uh, you know, a lot of people think this, this is all this gut stuff and the information on the gut brain is new. But as you know, from working with me, I've got books in my library, uh, the abdominal and pelvic brain, first edition, 1899, second edition, 1907 by Byron Robinson, MD. If those books were republished today, they'd, they would be cutting edge technology it would blow people's minds. And actually, if a person researches on Google, I've actually found one of my students found that you can get Byron Robinson's book, The Abdominal and Pelvic Brain, I think for free on the internet. Now, I'll warn you, it's a very, very big and very technical book. But when you read what Byron Robinson was publishing in 1907, it, it was mind blowing. And even today, it, is, it would be considered revolutionary. So you know, just like we're having to recycle our archetypal beliefs back to older myths that are more earth centric and more holistic, we're coming back to the body and its connection to the environment as essential for our overall body, mind, well being. Mm -hmm. One of the things you mentioned there was the challenges with fiber. And yeah. Paul Saladino really goes into that and, and, and really sort of shines a lot of light on, you know, kind of the vegetarian vegan concepts and where a lot of their beliefs are just not true. And so anyone that's interested, I have a great podcast with Paul Saladino. We're planning our second podcast together and his new book called The Carnivore Code just came out and it's loaded with excellent research uh, that really, really seriously challenges these high fiber, uh, overly vegetable based diets head on. And uh, that's not to give people the wrong impression that I'm anti vegetables or anti plants or anti fiber. I'm all about having an intimate relationship with your body and finding out what it needs to balance itself. As Greg would tell you, having been a client of mine for two and a half years doing weekly coaching with me. So, um, Greg, when it comes to issues of lifestyle, you and I both practice and teach the six foundation principles, nutrition, hydration, and sleep. They're the feminine or yin principles, breathing, thinking, and movement are the masculine or yang principles. It's really rare for me to have a client with mental, emotional challenges that isn't challenged or out of balance in all six areas encapsulated by these foundation principles. And naturally that leads us right back to lifestyle issues. What are some of the lifestyle issues you had to overcome in our work together and found to be contributing factors to the uh, mental health challenges that you are experiencing that, and, and also that the clients that you're working with today are experiencing? Yeah, so we covered the nutrition piece. Um, so hydration is a big issue in the sense that a lot of people drink enough water, but the quality of the water is very poor. And I found yes. a huge connection between um, cognitive function and the consumption of adequate or inadequate minerals in the water. So one thing that was really important for me in my healing is to add either like a Celtic or Celtic sea salt or trace mineral drops and um, consuming water with adequate minerals was really, really important. Um, we talked about sleep where, I mean, the, the effects of sleep on the mind and cognition is just um, astounding. And to me, that's probably the number one factor that I see in myself and my clients to be an issue is the sleep not just sleep quantity, but sleep quality, especially because our environment is buzzing with all these EMFs and um, artificial lighting in the evening. So our circadian rhythms and our biological rhythms are very much disrupted. So we have nutrition, we have hydration, we have sleep. Then breathing is huge in the sense that the breathing and the mind mirror each other. And I've never worked with 
I, I've probably worked with, I could probably count on one hand the number of clients I've worked with that really actually had a normal breathing pattern. And me too. <laughs> I've never. <laughs> even, and you guys are more people than I have. So um, I'm talking even people that go to these long breathing shops and yeah. uh, workshops. And, and I've had people that have spent multiple days in Wim Hof workshops. And th again, this is nothing against Wim Hof, but what happens is they're learning advanced breathing techniques without learning how to take a proper diaphragmatic breath or how to learn to remove the restrictions to their normal breathing pattern or the causes mm -hmm. of their dysfunctional breathing pattern, which mm -hmm. I describe as learning how to slam dunk a basketball before you learn the rules of the game and how to dribble and pass the ball. Mm -hmm. So this is a real issue out there for those of you that are, you know, fascinated by breathing. I get all sorts of people here doing piston breathing and four, six, eight and yogic stuff, but they, they can't even breathe properly. Yeah. So obviously the breathing and the mind mirroring each other, but also if someone's a chest breather or a mouth breather, that one keeps the body in a fight or flight state. So it keeps you in your left brain and it's hard to balance the left and the right brain. It's hard to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. So that all has a huge effect on the mind. Um, Another thing is when someone's a mouth breather, a chest breather, they also have poor posture. They also have the forward yeah, head, yeah. the rounded shoulders. So that physiological posture has a huge effect on one's emotional state and the flow of energy through their body. So you're never going to see a happy, vibrant person with this depressed forward head, rounded shoulders posture. And you're never going to see a depressed person with this beautiful upright posture and they're breathing from their belly. So really the body and the mind are always mirroring each other and the breathing has such a huge influence on that. Um, it, it does. Uh, I could just interject there, Greg. Yeah. You know, one of the things I, I shared with you in, in our time together and I share with my students in, in the Holistic Lifestyle Coaching Program through the Czech Institute is that uh, research shows that processed sugar acidifies the blood very, very quickly and the pH of our blood has to be regulated extremely tightly at, at approximately 7.35. And so anytime somebody's eating processed sugar, it elevates their respiratory rate as an attempt to, to use oxygen to alkalinize the blood as a survival mechanism. But as soon as you start elevating respiratory rate, you trigger a sympathetic fight or flight reaction. The body is actually thinking it's running from a lion. Mm -hmm. And then the next thing you know, your mind starts projecting all these images of threats and you start seeing attention deficit like behavior as a product of that. So also, as you said, when you go into an elevated respiratory rate, the tendency is for the head to drop down and forward. And as you also know from our work together and, and your training through the Czech Institute, the craniofacial rule of thirds is such that your cranium has to be grow and develop in three equal thirds. And if one or both of the parents are malnourished, the growth and development of the child is such that the middle third, which is the nasal third, and the maxillary arch is typically too small for the mandible, so they get malocclusion. But with that comes nasal airways and often too small of an oral airway relative to body size. Mm -hmm. So they have to put their head forward and open their mouth to get enough oxygen, especially if they're doing physically demanding tasks, uh, such as any type of physical activity that triggers an aerobic response. And when we look at the psychology of posture, there's a great book called Somatics by Thomas Hanna, and he has two basic postures. The green light posture is the upright, uh, go for it, I can get the job done attitude that's not fear dominant, but more somebody with, with a high level of self-esteem. But when our head drops down and forward and we get into these fight or flight states from dietary imbalances and growth and development restrictions and the kind of... Um, dietary imbalances and lifestyle imbalances we're talking about. Th Thomas Hanna describes the red light posture. And when our head moves forward and down, it's the same position we're in when we're depressed or we're sad or we're feeling dejected or rejected or shameful or guilty. So because the body is really very, very much, in, as you've mentioned, fused with the mind, and most people don't realize 55% of all language is communicated by body language, posturing and gesturing and facial expression, not by words. So we're actually really conveying more in our communications by body language, posture and gesture 
than we are with the words themselves. And because, for example, it's almost impossible to be depressed if you stand up right and smile. And mm-hmm. I've taught this and showed this to thousands of people. It's almost impossible because if your body is smiling, it tells your mind you cannot be depressed. Mm-hmm. And this showed up, for example, in research with a uh, 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 Botox surgery where they would use Botox and they would kill off the nerves that controlled the muscles around the face to make the face have a certain look. But a lot of these women could no longer smile and they found that it triggered high levels of depression in them because they were unable to activate the facial muscles that were connected to uh, facial expressions and postures of happiness. So we, we really need to be conscious of the dangers of processed sugar the importance of proper breathing mechanics and healthy diet and lifestyle practices. And Mm -hmm. one of the things I wanted to bring up that you and I worked with that I think is so critical because we're in this world where people are just working, as I said, in this consumerist mythology where they think more cars, more houses, more clothes, more gadgets, more status ultimately is going to create freedom for them and happiness for them. But it's very evident that it's not. And one of the first things I do with all my clients and that you and I did is we got out your, your calendar for the week. And I said, now we've got to create sacred time. Mm -hmm. And in that sacred time, we map out time for meals. So you can sit and be with your food and practice mindfulness and chew your food. As we say, drink your food and eat your water. In other words, chew your food till it's liquid and don't slam mountains of water in your body let it mix with your saliva to charge it with your enzymes and your own life force energy so that the body is supported by it. Then we have to plan out where are we going to do time for doctor happiness and things that are happy making for individuals. Where are we going to map your exercise out? Where are we going to uh, put your social time in so you have adequate time for family and friends? Where are we going to guarantee that you're in bed on time, you're getting enough uh, sleep, and where are we going to make sure that in your day you have practice time for the practice of worship and gratitude for the abundance and the beauty of life? And without those things in place, we end up just identifying ourselves by what we're doing at work, how good our grades are, but we never really actually live unless we're fortunate enough to be totally engrossed in our our dream or our legacy but for many people it takes you know 35 40 years or or more to figure out what that really is how did how did it work for you when we mapped out sacred time for you and oriented your life around that well there's an old saying you can't give what you don't have so amen <laughs> <laughs> so if you're not giving yourself time to eat to sleep to exercise, to do inner work such as meditation, to get time in nature, you're not really filling your cup up. And if you're not filling your cup up first, you almost become dependent on other people to do it for you. So in terms of relationships, that can create a level of codependency and almost a level of resentment that you're not really kind of getting your own needs met. But in terms of creating time and space for that i found that just invaluable there was there was nothing that would replace sleep there was nothing that could replace proper nutrition and eating in a mindful space and a mindful setting and taking the time to chew your food having the time to meditate having the time to exercise and if i didn't get those foundational principles down then none of the other work None of the deeper work and none of the work with the OCD really mattered because it's kind of putting the cart before the horse. So to me, I mean, just your six foundational principles and four doctors, like if that stuff's not in place, there's really not much else that you can do. And all you're going to get is temporary results. Yeah. You know, when it comes to family and social health, which is there's so much research now on the importance of social health and the, the global mind and, and the social network and, you know, biopsychosocial medicine, really the whole social element they found is critical to our health. 
And in my experience working with a a wide variety of people with the kinds of mental emotional disorders we're discussing here, there's quite a common pattern amongst them in that there is often unresolved trauma that goes all the way back to in utero, childhood, and their developmental years from birth to 21 when the ego should be formed but often isn't today. And these traumas range from verbal to emotional to mental abuse to physical abuse to sexual abuse, etc. But sadly, when I track what the belief systems that the parents were programming into their children, I find they're often, they often stem from the fundamentalist ideas of religion and what God wants. And many of these fundamentalist religions to this very day practice the dictum, spare the rod and spoil the child. And so you know, without a long expose, you know, there's all sorts of puritanical beliefs and kids are pressured to dress a certain way and to talk certain ways and you never touch their genitals. And you're not allowed to see this on television, which relates to sex, which is, which is linked directly to our very big problem with pornography addiction. So I'm curious to hear your opinion on, on how much of a contributor to mental health challenges these issues are and, and what you find in your own clientele. Yeah. So in terms of the trauma, like we alluded to earlier when we started, a lot of these issues get initiated with a trauma in the sense, especially with OCD, in the sense that we set up these conditions and these routines and these rituals as a way of making sure that we never re-experience the trauma. So whenever there's a trauma from an early age, you create a psyche and a nervous system that's always in a a posture of avoidance. And when you're in a posture of avoidance, you're always going to have a certain level of anxiety, a certain level of obsessive compulsive disorder, and a certain level of stress and the body and the nervous system will stay in that fight or flight state. So that creates a lot of disharmony in in the psyche, which contributes to a lot of these issues. In terms of religion and what God wants, as soon as you say the statement God wants, you've set up a God that has conditions. And whenever you set up a God that has conditions, you set up a God that has judgments. And when you you program that into a child whose brain is a sponge, you create a brain and a psyche that's already creating conditions and judgments. And A mind that has anxiety, depression, OCD, these are minds that are really rooted and stuck in certain judgments and stuck in certain conditions and really can't step outside of it. So one of the big things that you and I talked about was what God really is and what God really means to me. And that was actually profoundly healing in the sense that God became absolute and unconditional And the mind can only exist in the relative. So as soon as you step into that absolute or step into that unconditional state, you've already transcended the mind because the mind can't exist in that state. So any, any, uh, any symptoms that someone might have, whether it be OCD, anxiety, depression, the conditions and judgments that are creating a lot of those issues start to really disintegrate and lose their hold on you once you get clear on what God is. So, yes. So that's 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 hugely important and I underestimated how important that was until I really experienced it. And it yes, was well, profoundly healing. Yes, and and you know, just so that people know, you come from a, a Jewish family, so your mm-hmm. your upbringing is is not Christian in the sense of Christianity, it's Jewish in in the sense of Judaism, but these fundamentalist ideas are, you know, 85% of the people in the world claim religious affiliation. So that means for every hundred people you run into, there's going to be Christian programming. And as you and I both know from all the work we've done and, and all the training you've had through the Czech Institute, even people that think they're atheists are living in a Christian culture. Yeah. So you can't separate yourself from the Milu in which you grew up, right? You know, um, it it doesn't matter if you think that nature is out there and you're here, you're a product of nature. And if you go against the laws of nature, you're going to suffer the problems no matter what city you're in, because you are nature walking. 
So one in a city who doesn't think nature has anything to do with them and forget six foundation principles and four doctors has denatured themselves. And that's a great way to begin to have a lot of mental, emotional problems. Yeah. And uh, uh, you know, one thing, uh, one thing that just came to me when you're, when you're talking is uh, that you, I, I grew up in a, in a Jewish family and went to Hebrew school and was bar mitzvah and all that. And the traditional Judeo-Christian interpretation of God is really a God that's externalized. It's something that's a being that's outside of you. And yes, when controlling you, you. <laughs> yes, when you create a God that's outside of you and looking down on you, it's almost like you're a child in school sitting at your desk and you're doodling on your paper and there's a school teacher walking around just looking over your shoulder to see what you're doing all the time. And that child starts to feel a lot of anxiety. So when you create an image of God that's very similar to that, then there's almost this low level anxiety all the time that we're actually unaware of. Yes, so, and it, it, ex yeah. it externalizes God and keeps you in the position of child because in all the Abrahamic religions, God is the father. Mm -hmm. So people keep on looking to the father figure, which psychologically means they never actually grow up and accept responsibility for the fact that they're a co-creator with the universe, that their thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors are the main driving force behind what's manifesting the events, the experiences, and the relationships of their life. Mm -hmm. And somebody who's caught in that child position naturally runs to anybody wearing a white jacket because they represent the priests, which were the emissaries to the father. So a lot of what we're talking about really, really, you could say is a symptom of a world culture that is not growing up and accepting responsibility for the power of their own mind and their own relationship with the universe and the source of all that is. And you know, the, the silly thing is, is if God was, was the kind of God that the religions speak about, since God is the source of all that is, to burn somebody in hell would mean God would be burning itself in hell, which really does not make for a very intelligent God. I mean, I figured that out at eight years of, old, of age and wondered why the hell, how can they even be saying these things when it doesn't make any sense? And I had enough logic in myself as an eight-year-old to get myself in lots of trouble challenging people like pastors and preachers with questions like that. But yeah. fortunately for me, when I, my mother joined the self-realization fellowship, the monks were right on spot. They addressed these issues and took all that pain out of me. And so, you know, if any of you haven't read the autobiography of a yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda, it's a great introduction to Yogananda's teachings and self-realization fellowship. And, you know, Osho said the Eastern religions are religions for adults because there's no big daddy in the sky and you have to take responsibility for your choices. And the Western religions are religions for children because they always externalize authority to an authority figure or to an imaginary father figure in the sky. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I'd like to ask you about is your thoughts on the connection between um, mental health and all the modern technology. You know, I find in my work with athletes, for example, and people that they're going gadget crazy these days. And there's some real consequences with regard, not only to one's overall well-being, but mental health, for example, calorie counters, aura rings, heart rate monitors, you know, uh, everything, the iPhone, eye watches that'll tell you, you know, how many pimples you got. It seems to me like people are just falling hook, line and sinker for all this technology, which is taking them out of the responsibility of engaging their body to find out this information. And one of the things the whole biohacking industry and functional medicine, unfortunately, has led to is doctors treating patients and people treating themselves as data, not as human beings. So you go to a doctor today and they look at a bunch of data and they assume that's who you are, but they never actually pay attention to what caused the data to be there. In other words, what's raising your cortisol levels? What's causing the depressed hormone, be it T3 or whatever it is? What's the actual etiology? So they keep doing what I call cutting the tops off of the off of weeds. So in your experience, how how do you think some of these these modern technologies that we're going crazy with are 
lending themselves to mental emotional disorders and what's your uh, sort of what, what what would you suggest to people on how to handle this well one it's an addiction so <laughs> exactly <laughs> so first and foremost there's an addiction to screens there's an addiction to phones and laptops and televisions and um there's many reasons for that but the issues one is we talked about the neurotransmitter depletion which can create a lot of mood swings. It can create a lot of depression and anxiety. And it kind of desensitizes the receptors in the brain to a lot of these neurotransmitters. So that's a big issue. Another one is the, we talked about the overexposure to EMFs, which are causing a lot of inflammation, a lot of rising cortisol levels. And um, these are very disruptive to the brain. And it keeps the body in it also keeps the body in a fight or flight sympathetic state as well. So there's also an issue with when we're constantly using these gadgets, they create a numbing effect. And when we create a numbing effect, we disconnect ourselves from our own feelings, our own emotions, and our own thoughts. So it's kind of like a passive way of going unconscious. So whenever we have parts of ourselves that we don't want to experience, rather than engaging them fully like we used to do because we didn't have as many distractions, we can whip out the iPhone or turn on Netflix and basically numb those parts of us out. And it's basically an avoidance mechanism of the parts of ourselves we don't want to experience. So that numbing effect really kind of puts the brakes on the healing process and creates a level of apathy in engaging in your own life. So, yeah. There's I, I mean there's a few issues there. Another one is, is this is especially true with someone with OCD. Someone with OCD, their mind is very much it has a nature of being like this narrowly objective focus where someone who's more meditative And it's kind of like a yogi would have more of like an open focus. So an analogy I would use is if you take two fishermen, someone with OCD, they're basically spear fishing in which they're projecting the spear in one direction to the exclusion of all other possibilities. Someone who's in a meditative state or someone who's just outdoors out in nature where they're not fixated on anything and they have this open focus they are essentially fishing with a net where you drop the net in and you just allow things to come in. You don't make any judgments as to this is bad, this is good. You're just more in receptive mode than projection mode. When we're constantly exposed to the screens, we're constantly in this narrowly objective focus. And that also keeps us in a fight or flight left brain state. So There's a lot of reasons why this overexposure to technology is creating a lot of imbalances in the minds and the brain. And one of the most healing things you can do is just to get outdoors and you can actually use your eyes and your vision and practice spatial relationships. There's a great book called Open Focus Brain. I think either you or Dr. Oliver introduced it to me. Um, I think it's probably you. Dr. Oliver. I, I had it too. And I, I use some of the meditations I learned from that book with you, but it is very helpful. And it's amazing experiences when you start yeah. doing those meditations, isn't it? Yeah, it, it immediately shifts you into a parasympathetic state. And when essentially what you do is you use your vision to create these spatial relationships in the sense that you start seeing everything, but you're looking at nothing. So it's like this yes. broad spectrum gaze that has an amazing integration of the left and the right brain and can really balance out the effects of using too much technology. So getting outdoors and practicing this open focus brain is is really, really powerful. So, uh, I mean, there's, there's many other ways in which the technology really, really affects um, one's body and one's mind. And like you said, the overuse of these um, self-quantification devices and biohacking devices, it really creates kind of a warship of data rather than engaging your own body. 
And like we said, a lot of these issues that we're talking about, whether it's anxiety, depression, OCD, ADD, a lot of these people, most of these people are so stuck in their minds that they're so disconnected from the body and the technology and all these devices just further that imbalance. Yeah, one of the most dangerous aspects of being stuck in your mind is, is as you know, people tend to believe their thoughts as though they're real, even mm-hmm. when they're completely uh, out of touch with reality, you know, and, and that's sort of the sign of a crazy person, really, someone who can't distinguish their their thoughts and fantasies from reality. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, uh, part of the work I do is is giving people the tools as we teach in Holistic Lifestyle Coach Level 2 we have techniques from like the the coin drill or the mind flip and the ABCD method and other techniques of holistic thinking to help people really learn to question their thoughts. And in Steiner's model of the soul, it, it is the point at which you begin to question your thoughts. He calls it the awareness soul. He says, when you actually begin to question your own thoughts, honestly, that's when you're really beginning to be an adult and take responsibility for yourself. And a lot of these mental, emotional um, challenges we're talking about stem right from believing a person's thoughts as opposed to going into them, which, you know, which reminds me to bring up the point, you know, you, when we started working together, this, this female being that was so scary showed up. Now's a good time when it comes to engaging your thoughts and not believing them Tell everybody what happened when I guided you into actually confronting her instead of running from her and being afraid. What what happened? Well, the engagement of her allowed me to come to the realization that she actually came as a guide. And <laughs> she was not something to run from or get rid of, but something to engage and learn from. And she actually brought me so much wisdom and so many teachings that I would have never would have taken the years, maybe lifetimes to acquire without that experience. So a lot of a lot of the negativity and dark aspects of the minds and projections that we experience, if we have the courage to go into them rather than avoid them, there's actually tremendous gifts inside of them. Like Joseph Campbell says, like the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. So this woman that I had experience, had an experience with initially where I became frightened and vulnerable, that was the cave I was afraid to enter. And once you guided me into that cave, I realized that there was tremendous treasures in there. And the treasures were just spiritual growth and the tools and techniques that I needed to now not not just heal myself, but work with clients on a daily basis with. And isn't it interesting that I shared earlier that the soul of a male typically shows up as a female entity mm-hmm. when we do inner work and wow. there's your, there's your guide. Yeah, absolutely. I'm absolutely. curious what contribution to the massive amount of mental health challenges we face today do you feel stems from our social conditioning on work versus rest and our tendency to identify ourselves as what we do versus who we really are? Yeah. So, well, one, when you're overly identified with the mind, you're identified with belief systems. And when you're identified with belief systems, those are not based on being, those are based on doing. So when we're socially conditioned to be productive and work hard and um, no pain, no gain, no rest. Like no one, no child was ever rewarded for how well they slept or how well they rested. They were never Or how well they ate. Yeah. Or how well they, yeah. <laughs> <Or how> well <laughs> they breathed. <laughs> yeah. They're recognized for the score they got on the test, for how many points they scored in the game. So our sense of self is so identified with our level of productivity and achievement that when we're not doing and we're simply being, it almost creates an identity crisis. And that creates a lot of stress and anxiety. So it's hard to sit in that space for a lot of people. So that creates an addiction to doing. But the important thing there is you're, you're working out of fear. You're not working out of love. 
you're you're moving away from something rather than moving towards something. And a lot of this, especially someone with OCD or someone with a lot of inner turmoil, on the surface, these people have very strong work ethics. So society, like I, I experienced this where when I had so much inner turmoil and I could not sit with myself, I was training in the gym two, three hours a day. I was hitting golf balls seven, eight, nine hours a day. I was going home and studying. So on the surface, people were like, wow, like this kid's got such an amazing work ethic. But what they didn't know was I was dying inside. I was completely running from myself. And as long as I engaged in the work, I was able to avoid the experience of what was going on inside of me. So was I, was I moving towards something or was I moving quickly away from something? Was I working out of fear or was I working out of love? And when you work out of fear and you're working and moving away from something, that's how you burn out. I burnt out in golf pretty darn quickly when I adopted those habits. So that identification with doing rather than being is a real, a real recipe for disaster. And also when someone's experiencing a lot of these psychological conditions and there's that much inner turmoil, the work ethic that we, that we perceive as to be positive and admirable is really a form of self-medicating and an avoidance of oneself. So it's really important to, when you see these cases, to actually look beneath the surface at what's driving a lot of it. Because a lot of times the productivity and the work and um, the engagement is actually coming from a very unhealthy place. Yes. You know, all, all, all these discussions we've had up to this point, and, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty far into the podcast now. We're about uh, two hours and 15 minutes or so. We've, we've got a few questions le left here that are important. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I really think everything we're discussing is absolutely critical for people out in the world to not only understand and hear, but to share. Because this, as you know, these are serious problems that are threatening our survival at a, at a, at a really real level and our disconnection from nature and the consequences of that. But we've used the word addiction probably 15 or 20 times now. So I'd like to talk a little bit about addiction and mental health and your own experiences. So when we look at the statistics, uh, these statistics on addiction in society, they're very, very shocking. And as you know, people tend to get addicted to so many things from work to alcohol to drugs to sex, pornography, exercise, TV, phones, video games, cigarettes, etc. And interestingly, Shaman, anthrop shaman and anthropologist Angeles Arian studied addiction among uh, cultures all over the world. I think over 100 cultures. It took her 10 years to do her research. And she included people from a variety of socioeconomical statuses. So the research wasn't biased by just rich people or poor people. And basically, when she concluded her research, she identified that the root causes of addiction in all cultures boiled down to four key issues intensity, being raised or living in an intense environment, being raised in an environment where people and teachers and caregivers focused on what was wrong instead of what was working, perfectionism, and the addiction to the need to know, which stems right back to our discussions on all the challenges with academic standards and kids feeling that they, they can't be loved if they're not getting good grades. Therefore, the only way to, to feel safe to bring your report card home or, or not be ostracized by your peers is you have to keep knowing more and more and more and more. You can't keep up. So, mm -hmm. you know, OCD is itself a challenge. It is much like an addiction to constantly checking on this or that. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us if any of these four causes of addiction were part of your challenge and what you see when working with others with these kinds of mental, emotional challenges that are so common today? How about all of them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've had to, you know, I've had my perfectionism. I'm fortunate. Um, you know, I, I've always had a, a sense that there's a tipping point where if you work past a certain point, no matter what it is, cleaning a barn, uh, fixing an engine, um, cutting your fingernails, whatever it is, there's a certain point. If you work past that point, you're actually not being efficient and you're not getting anything done. You're just wasting time. And I think being raised on a farm where 
perfectionism just doesn't help. There's too much work to get done. You know, my father was not so much into perfection, but were you doing the job functionally? You know, was the barn clean enough that the animals would stay healthy? Were the animals watered? You know, did you castrate the animal without unnecessary damage? How many stitches in, in the wound of an animal is enough versus is, is overkill. So I'm fortunate, uh, there, you know, perfectionism was quite intense when I was in our uh, military aviation uh, training, uh, to repair weapon systems on Cobra helix and uh, helicopters and electronics school was very intense, but it was intense for a reason because, you know, making mistakes there gets a lot of people killed, but myself, man, my family upbringing was brutally intense and my parents regularly focused on what was wrong. And because I always had challenges in school and found that whenever I did good at work, which depended on me knowing what to do, I really did develop this deep sense of the need to know. But fortunately for me, I turned it into a hobby. I really found from a spiritual perspective that as I learned more and more about the different sciences and about the humanities and about nature, it had sort of a spiritual effect on me and it helped me understand what God was and what nature was and what the universe was. So instead of actually becoming an addiction for me, it almost became a form of spiritual practice. Right. Um, how have you dealt with these and which ones of them do you feel were the most challenging to you or that you feel are most challenging out there for people in general? Well, I'll give a few examples of each one. First and foremost, the the addict is a common archetype. And the addict archetype, obviously every archetype has a positive and a negative side. Um, the destructive side of the addict is a certain level of intensity that one is not able to handle and needs to self-medicate. The positive side of the addict archetype is simply passion. When that intensity is managed properly, it shows up as passion. And that seems to be like what you experience. You experience passion for learning, passion for exercise. And um, that's a positive um, application of that energy. But when that energy becomes destructive and it shows up as destructive intensity, When someone has OCD and they experience a certain level of intensity that needs a release valve, that release valve shows up as these routines and rituals. And if they're not showing up with OCD, they show up as addiction to substances because one has to numb out or dull out that level of intensity because if you don't have that release valve, that you're going to explode. So the intensity, I would say, is probably the most common one amongst a lot of these issues. And the fixation on what's not working, I would say with a lot of these psychological conditions that originate with a trauma, when you have a trauma that you want to make sure you never re-experience, you're constantly going to be fixated on what's not working as a survival mechanism. The perfectionism is very common amongst obsessive compulsive people and it can show up in subtle ways you actually see this a lot in the gym with people who are addicted to working out there's an obsessive compulsive addiction to the um, aesthetics of their body and you see that a lot with bodybuilders and um, those types of gym enthusiasts you also see perfectionism when someone is experiencing these conditions in which their internal state has created so much chaos and their mind feels so out of control and out of order that they actually compensate rather than engaging their internal life and trying to put that in order, they get addicted to making sure everything externally is in order. So when your internal environment feels chaotic and you don't want to engage that, what you do is you try and control your external environment. And that's when you see a lot of other people people. or other people. Exactly. Um, So that's where you see like the need for cleanliness, the need to align things and like your classic obsessive compulsive behavior. A lot of that is rooted in, in internal chaos that needs to be externalized because really one can't sit in the storm inside of them. Um, 
Then also the, the needing to know is really that addiction to the mind. And once you're addicted to thought patterns and mental activity, it's hard to let go of that need to know. And how that, that actually shows up very much in the health world in the sense that people are so addicted to testing everything. And I experienced this myself. I was always like, let's do another stool test. Let's do another blood test. And that's that addiction to, <laughs> to know where um, that can really kind of hold you prisoner as well. So really with a lot of these issues, most people on a subtle level are experiencing all four of them at once. Yes. And I've had a number of clients with, we could just call it a variety of mental challenges Mm -hmm. that are, you know, I always, as you know, from working with me, I always want to make sure there's no, you know, underlying challenges in the body, such as biochemical issues, such as parasite and fungal infections, heavy metals. But I've got many clients that just keep running test after test and they go, I think there's something wrong. I think we're missing something. And of course, they're not doing their power animal work. They're not doing their soul recovery work. They're not doing their meditation, their art therapy, but they'll rush to these tests like they're the word of God. And what giggles, what makes me giggle is, is in many cases, the tests keep coming back negative and and the doctors say to them, you're healthier than most anybody that I see. And so they keep getting turned right back to the mirror. And I say, well, how many thousands of dollars you want to spend before you realize there's no escape from actually doing the work of healing, growing, and becoming an adult and taking a responsibility for the choices you make and the values you live. Exactly. And uh, some, of them are, some of them are right now out there still struggling with this. So, um, you know, as, as this is what I mean when I say as a therapist, I try to avoid professional babysitting because if, if a person's not ready to really invest in themselves and take responsibility for being their own mother and father. They're very, very draining people to coach. And that's one of the reasons I charge the amount of money I do. I really value my time. So if someone's not willing to make an investment in my time, I know they're not going to invest in themselves either. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, we're getting towards the end. I've I've got a couple more questions for you. Um, From your time working with me, you know that I define connecting uh, spirituality as connecting to a greater whole. I also teach that all challenges are opportunities if they're handled with the right mindset, which often requires support from others with both the skills as therapists and coaches uh, that also have the right mindset themselves. And that narrows the market down a lot. But those that are genuinely spiritually minded know that something always grows out of something else. Like look at all the wisdom that grew out of your challenge and how many people's lives you're touching now in ways that you never would have, if we hadn't have done this healing work, wouldn't you have, wouldn't you agree with that? Of course. Absolutely. So I'd love it if you could share some of your spiritual experiences from our work together and suggestions you have uh, for people with OCD or other common mental challenges with regard to how to seeing their, their challenge as a, as a spiritual growth opportunity. Yeah. So well, first and foremost, like we were talking about earlier, a lot of your work is getting clear on what God is. And that was, I believe, one of our first sessions that we ever had. And that awareness. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, went right, I went right to the heart of it. <laughs> yeah. So if you consider that God is unconditional and absolute, that means that Obviously, God sets up no conditions, no judgments, and absolute means God exists within everything and everyone. Mind only exists in the relative. So mind can only know something because it knows it's not other things. So the mind can only exist within certain levels of boundaries, borders, and conditions. Someone with OCD has a mind that is constantly setting up these boundaries, these borders, these conditions, labeling things as good and bad, right and wrong. I should be experiencing this. I shouldn't be experiencing that. So a lot of our mental stress comes up from developing these constructs. So given that, that being said, I had this awareness of, well, if God exists within everything and everyone, then God also exists within this OCD. And if I were to access the divine inside of myself, 
I would have to let go of all conditions. And one of my mental conditions was that I should be getting rid of this OCD. So I was like, wow, if I need, to, if I ever want to access the divine inside of me, I have to let go of all needs to change anything. All needs uh, oh, great to spirit. Anything. Because the moment I try and exclude anything from my present experience, I've already separated myself from the divine. You've and also created an illusion. You've also created an illusion. So sitting in that space took such a level of surrender because I spent so many years avoiding a lot of that interactivity that once I had the courage to surrender to all of it and include all of it in my current experience, something amazing happens is I started to develop the ability to witness all of the chaos and all of the activity, almost like I was sitting in the eye of the storm. And I had this awareness that that divine consciousness was sitting in the eye. And the storm around me, if I was able to stay in that unconditional space, had no grip or no hold on me whatsoever. And once I sat in that space, all of the thought patterns, all of the energy from the OCD started to dissipate because there was nothing engaging it anymore. And that was probably the first, I would call, spiritual awakening I ever had was this awareness of who is this person watching all of this happen? And it was critical for me to get clear on my concept of God and the idea that it exists within me and that awareness and that witness and that observer that sets no conditions, that sets no boundaries, no borders, no judgments is really the divine inside of me. And once I began to sit in that space, literally within days, weeks, my symptoms just started to just dissolve completely. And I would be able to sit in this silence that I had never experienced in before. And when I would sit in that silence, I would literally having, I would have tears running down my face because if anyone experienced the amount of mental chaos that I had for a good half a decade, and then to really sit in a space where the mind is just completely silent and you're completely aware of the silence, that is a very deep spiritual experience. And there was almost a level of fear around it because there was nothing left for my ego to identify with. And what I also found was that silence is not silent. That silence is pretty explosive. And when you sit in that silence, that body begins to heal and the mind begins to recalibrate. And amazing things happen when you're kind of in that, that like that vertical consciousness. Like if you think of the cross as like the vertical being like the eternal present, the horizontal being linear time of past, present, future, the more you sit in that space of vertical consciousness, the more linear time really doesn't have a hold on you and healing happens immediately. And the more belief systems and judgments and conditions and borders and boundaries that we get attached to in the mind, the more that psychic weight takes that vertical axis and almost like tips it into the horizontal and then healing takes way longer. So just getting clear on all of that and being able to sit in that space is probably the most important aspect of, I believe, healing from anything. Yes. So, Beautifully stated, man. Yeah. I really, I really, uh, you know, listening to you talk after all we've been through, uh, I'm having a, a spiritual experience myself. It's it's such an amazing thing for me to be here with you doing this podcast and feeling the difference between the Greg I started with and the Greg that I'm talking to now and knowing that you're out there with the tools now and the genuine authentic experience of becoming an individuated whole human being that can guide other people like that. I, all I can say is congratulations, my man. You've really, Grasshopper, you've taken the pebble. 
<laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for taking the journey with me. Well, you know, it was a beautiful journey. And, uh, you know, I, I had a lot of empathy and compassion for you. I, you know, I, I've worked with so many people with these challenges. And, you know, one of the scary things is there's so many people in this state out there and they run off and start doing psychedelic medicines and stuff, not realizing, you know, if you can't handle your mind without drugs, taking drugs is really just going to magnify psychedelic medicines, amplify your internal state for better or worse. So if you're a happy, joyous person, you can become extremely happy and joyous. But if you're really trapped in your head and your guilt and your shame and your pain, then the plant medicines will amplify that so that it's undeniably alive inside of you, which the positive of that is you get to see what you're creating. The negative is if you don't have skilled help, you can get so trapped in it, you'll go down that rabbit hole and you know, you might even commit suicide because it's so intense. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that concerns me about all these fundamentalist religious belief systems and all the, you know, issues of what God wants and sin and all that stuff is that it triggers a perpetual self-judgment that leads to tremendous amounts of guilt and shame. And the amount of the guilt and shame quickly becomes so much that a person has to wall off their inner world. They have to repress and bury it which not only magnifies their shadow and takes them more and more into projecting their biases out onto others so they don't have to deal with their own uh, self-judgment, but it leads to the world being such an unpleasant place to be that really the only way to deal with it for a lot of these people is to commit suicide, which is really, really sad for me. And, and you know, I've seen it happen so many times. Yeah. Now, moving forward, we, we've already talked about the thinking, feeling, sensation, and intuition, and that could be a deep conversation. Mm -hmm. And we've gone for quite a while now. So just for the sake of the listeners and to, to keep it short, I'm going to jump to our pretty much our last uh, question here, which is OCD mental health and what I call the paradox. You've shared that there is a paradox in the deepest truths of how the mind works. I'm curious to know how the teachings I offer through the Czech Institute training and what I've shared with you regarding the deeper truths of the mystics and the Eastern religions helped you heal and how you use them in your practice to help others with mental challenges today. Now, you did allude to that with your discussions of getting into the stillness, but is there anything you'd like to add to when it comes to the paradox of all this? Yeah, I mean, in terms of your teachings, one of the most important um, elements is the awareness of the complementary opposites and how the positive and the negative are necessary um, to bring balance and wholeness. So that's one of the most important concepts to consider when working with the mind with any of these issues. In terms of the paradox, there's, there's huge paradox in terms of working with the mind, especially with the, the flow of these thought patterns that really any condition can be rooted in is one, if you try to control it, it controls you. So there's a paradox right there. Um, <laughs> it's a good, it's a real one too. Yeah, whatever you try and control controls you. So, um, so that doesn't work. Um, also, when you're, when you're working with thought patterns such as OCD or really, really any obsessive thought patterns, Trying to get rid of it actually enlivens and fuels it. So the act of saying, I should, I should not be experiencing this. I want to get rid of these thought patterns. The old saying, what you resist persists. So whatever you try and get rid of actually grows and expands. And there's a paradox in the sense that I remember reading a lot of Taoist teachings. And a lot of the teachings would have these paradox statements such as if you want to get rid of something, allow it to grow. If you want to shrink something, allow it to expand. And to the rational mind, you're like, that doesn't make sense. But then I would say, all right, let's take these teachings and let me engage these thought patterns that I'm experiencing. So I would actually start working with my mind almost like a puppy. And I'd be like, all right, you want to you wanna engage in all this activity? All right, go expand, go, go play, go do all of it, anything you want to do. And all of a sudden, it stays right by your side. And then you're like, all right, if I try and resist you, what does it do? It's like a puppy pulling on the leash. Like, I need space. I need, yeah. I need. So 
there's a that there's huge paradox in terms of working with these thought patterns and these thought bodies where the more space you give it the less space it takes the more you allow these thought patterns to grow and expand the more they shrink and dissolve so when it comes, <laughs> when it comes to the flow of the minds it's literally one big paradox um, it is so it's that that's where the OCD for me was the greatest spiritual teacher I ever had. And if I didn't experience the OCD and apply all these Eastern teachings to my mind, I would have never like really had firsthand experience. Like I could study it like intellectually, but like it would never actually mean anything until like I really engaged and experienced it. So the OCD at large was really my greatest teacher because it allowed me to experience the truths of these deep, profound teachings. And the deepest truths and the deepest teachings that really have an Im- had an impact on my life are pure paradox. And the mind is really just an expression of that. So, Well, now you know why they say Buddha was the first psychologist. Yeah. And I think he would and be classified as a schizophrenic nowadays, too. <laughs> he, might, he might very well have been. Yeah. But there's a point I wanted to bring up before we close, and that is whenever you try to get rid of something, you energize it, right? You have to, if you, if you uh, focus on getting rid of an animal like your dog or your cat out of your living room, you have to chase it and catch it. And therefore, you're putting energy into it. If you think you've got to get rid of this thought or that thought, well, then you've deified it. You've objectified it. You are now pouring your energy into it. And it produces exactly the same result that leads people to stop meditating when they say, I can't stop my mind. And I always laugh and say, well, you you can't stop a mind because by definition, a mind is a thinking process. So that would be like stopping the ocean from waving. Well, it wouldn't be an ocean if it didn't wave. And you create more so, by trying to stop it. <laughs> you do. You you got to run out and chase the wave to try to grab it. You know, it's like trying to, you know, use a thimble to push back a tidal wave. Mm-hmm. But uh, what a, what a fantastic journey. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I hope everybody else has really enjoyed it too. Your journey, I think, is very therapeutic for everybody that listens to this because I don't think there's a single person listening that either isn't dealing with these challenges at some level or for sure doesn't know somebody in their own family or in their own circle of friends that has these problems, um, or shall I say, these opportunities. But uh, thank you very much, Greg, for making the journey. And I'm grateful, very grateful that that you're out there and that you have the skills to help people with these things and that you're running your meditation workshops and doing the healing work you're doing. And, uh, I really hope that people that need some help with this, uh, take the opportunity to track you down and and get your help because you've really definitely earned your, your wings, so to speak. You know, when, when we become a paratrooper, we say you've got your wings now, which means you're, Mm -hmm. you're an elite soldier. You're not just a foot soldier. So you've earned your wings and uh, what a, what a great journey together. So thank you very much. Where can people find out more about you and any offerings that you have or how to hire you as their uh, holistic lifestyle coach or therapist? Yeah. So if you go to ghstraining.co, you'll have all my contact info there, all the information about my practice. Um, I'm located in New Jersey, just outside Manhattan, but I also work via Skype and FaceTime. Um, so all my contact info is there. I'm on Instagram as GHS training, but I'm not that active on social media. The best way to get in touch with me is through my website and my contact info there. So that would be your listener's best bet to uh, get in touch with me. Awesome. Well, if you guys enjoyed this interview, please share it as widely as possible. I think. It should be clear to all of you listening, I'm not selling magic bullets or gadgets or take this pill and all your problems will go away. And I'm certainly not saying run off into the jungle and do ayahuasca or any of this other stuff. There's a time and a place for everything, as Greg will tell you and all my students will tell you. I say there's no such thing as a bad exercise or a bad drug, only an incorrectly prescribed exercise or drug. And what we've just talked about for you know two and three quarters of an hour here 
is really the product of Greg's deep journey into himself and his honest willingness to heal and to evaluate the belief systems he gained as a child. And, you know, though we are all implanted with challenging belief systems because they are designed to produce the resistance within us to make us question and to give us an opportunity to grow because without polarity, consciousness cannot emerge. Consciousness cannot exist without polarity. But once you learn how to get beyond polarity to that still point in the middle of the storm Greg talked about, then you can take a break from the polarity. And once you get to the center of that circle, I think, Greg, you'd agree, it immediately gives you a real sense of empathy and compassion for people that are still stuck in the storm, doesn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, there's no space like that. Well, awesome. Thank you, everybody, for listening and, sh- and for sharing. And uh, if you have questions that you'd like to ask on an upcoming Q&A session with me, feel free to send them in. And uh, uh, if you, well, there's one other thing I was going to say, questions. Well, anyhow, if you have questions uh, or if you have ideas that you'd like me to uh, potentially consider for upcoming podcasts, I'm very open to that. And if you have comments about how the podcast has been beneficial to you, please put it on iTunes or whichever uh, podcast outlet you're using uh, because it really helps me uh, grow the listenership. And as I think all of you can see, I'm really genuinely trying to do my best to share my life's experience and the experience of all my guests to help make the world a better place for all living beings and, and the children of tomorrow. So Greg, thank you very much. And thank you to all of you listeners for joining Greg and I today. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Greg Schmaus. You can follow Greg on Instagram at ghs underscore training or on his website, ghstraining.co. Greg is offering Paul's listeners a 20% discount off a one-hour phone or Skype consultation You can reach Greg via his website at ghstraining.co. Follow Paul on Instagram and Twitter at Living4D Podcast or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash Living4D with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and at the Czech Institute's new streaming media site, chikiva.com.